It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Great panel for you. Amy Webb, Brianna Wu, Michael Nunez. We're going to talk about the Galaxy S9 just announced from Samsung. Privacy regulations in the U.S. and China and their differences. Uh, and Apple repair services calling 911 thousands of times. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 655, recorded Sunday, February 25th, 2018. Banana is phone. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Audible. Audible makes getting more books in your life easy. Sign up for the Gold Plus One plan to get two free books and a 30-day free trial at audible.com slash twit2. And by LegalZoom. Get your dream business up and running or take control of your family's future with LegalZoom. For special savings, visit LegalZoom.com and enter TWIT at checkout. And by ZipRecruiter. Hiring? ZipRecruiter has revolutionized how you'll do it. Their technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. Try it free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash TWIT. And by Cloud Spanner from Google Cloud Platform. Cloud Spanner is the only horizontally scalable and strongly consistent relational database service. To learn more, visit g.co slash getspanner today. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. Very good panel this week. I say that every week, but I mean it every week. Let's start with Amy Webb. She's a futurist and uh, the author of a book. This is actually how I met her, called The Signals Are Talking. Why Today's Fringe is Tomorrow's Mainstream. She uh, is uh, joining us from, where are you? Somewhere different. You're in Nashville. I know. Uh, this week I'm in Nashville. I'm speaking at a big uh, conference tomorrow on the future of energy. Nice. Ooh, Founder of the Future Today Institute. You're a new FTI trend report. I, you just held it up. It's going to be out soon, right? It's so exciting. It launches at South by Southwest on uh, March 11th. We have 225 emerging tech trends this year. This is the 11th annual edition of the Look report. It's our wow. largest yet. And that's... it has had 6 million cumulative views. So this thing is, wow. I can't wait. That's fantastic. It's, it's digital also, but we've, we've made some printed versions. So. Hey, so it goes online on March 10th. It's uh, March actually you can 11th. sign up to receive an advance copy now on our website, but on March 11th it'll be everywhere, so Very you good. can download it. From we'll be in Austin on over. March 9th doing a panel down there. If you're in the area, come by. We'll say. All right. That. We're All at right. the uh, Capital One House uh, in Anton's, but unfortunately our panel's at 8:30 in the morning. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a panel on. Actually, I'm excited about it on uh, consumer security. You know, cons oh. consumers hear all the you know meltdown specter. Equifax, all the issues, uh, but what sh what what are what is the what is really uh, at stake for them, and what should what are the real practical things we should do? We have some really good security experts on, so that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you, Amy, for being here all the way from Nashville. Also yeah, joining yeah. us from the Massachusetts Eighth District, where she is a candidate for U.S. Congress. Brianna Wu, Space Cat Gal, is back in the studio. Hey, how you doing, <laughs> Brianna? I, I'm feeling really good. I have to tell you, I've had so many conversations with uh, elected officials as I'm running for Congress here about cybersecurity. It's so depressing because you will talk to people and they are in charge of like a, a massive computer system here in the state. And you'll ask them specific technical questions. And all they ever say is like, uh, we have an IT department. Like, no Oh, one they're not even thinking ever, about it. They're not even paying they're it. They're not. I was trying to talk to someone the other day about like, look, if you've got these machines, these voting machines, you've got to check and make sure the version of software that's running on it is the same software you think it is. And it's just, it's a level too high for them to even talk about. Wow. Like we've got to have technologically literate people actually it's making decisions at some Highly problematic. Point. Yeah, I yep. find it also very frustrating that as far as I could tell, Equifax has gotten off scot-free. <sighs> no punishment, none at all. Uh, no consequences whatsoever. In fact, they made money on the breach. 
What really gets me about that, Leo, is if you actually go out and talk to people, they are as angry about Equifax as you could possibly imagine. Of course. You talk to them, it doesn't matter if they're a Republican, a Democrat, not politically active, you just see their blood pressure rising. And you would think that just out of pure self-interest, you would have politicians talking about it. And they just, I don't know if they're just so like caught up in the system or they just don't care. But for whatever reason, it's like you said, they got off scot-free. Yeah. Hey, Brianna, are yeah. they doing anything as a, for candidates in the state of Massachusetts around election fraud? And is there any, like what, what's happening? I can't say that I've had really big talks with the secretary of state's office about that. Uh, we are currently are having, uh, yeah. there are concerns, but when you ask questions, I, I hope I'm not burning any bridges when I say I haven't liked the answers I've gotten to that question. So, you know, we need to take it more seriously. Also in the studio, well, actually not in the studio, in his studio, he's at Mashable, Michael Nunez. You remember him from Popular Science. He's now at, over at uh, the Mashable headquarters, where he actually is at work on a Sunday evening. I'm sorry, deputy tech editor over there. Hey, Michael. Hey, how are you? Great to have you, as always. I'm you, uh, here, you're not, you're, you're, everybody, it's empty over there. That's because everybody's in Barcelona, probably, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. So I've been here for a little while uh, monitoring our Mobile World Congress coverage, obviously the Samsung Galaxy S9 release and a couple of other of the Android phones um, that came out today. So it's been a busy Sunday, but, uh, you know, it's it's what I love to do. So I'm happy to be here. We uh, we actually streamed uh, along with Samsung the uh, event uh, 9 a.m. our time, noon your time uh, and about five in the evening in Barcelona where they announced the S9. Looks like it went very well. Uh, very pleased to see Samsung does, did not follow Apple in almost any respect. And they were very proud to say, no notch. We still have a headphone jack. Yes, there's a fingerprint reader. Uh, but most importantly to me, they didn't raise the hike the price an awful lot. There's this, the uh, S9 is $720. The S9 Plus, the 6.2-inch model with dual cameras, $120 more, $840. That's not exactly holding the line, but it's still not a thousand dollar phone. Well, yep. it kind of is, though. Is it? It is. Amy says the, uh, it is. Well, so I have an S8, and I'm a pretty careful person, and I've now broken two screens because wow. the thing is it's slippery as butter and it's delicate. So I've. <laughs> Do you uh, not getting, put it in a case, or that's even with a oh, case? No. no, no, this is with a case. Wow. Uh, and yeah, so. Uh, and the, Butterfingers. And the people, it's not just me though. These these screens are constantly getting broken, and if you choose to repair, it's you know a couple hundred bucks. Now, do you so think you'd I, have the same problem with an iPhone 10, which is also an edge to edge uh, slippery? I would have so many more problems with an iPhone 10. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I loved it when you said earlier that uh, that Samsung isn't copying Apple. I mean, Apple, you know. Well, uh, okay, but there's no notch. Uh, they're doing dual cameras, but they're doing f 1.5 and f 2.4. Which Apple does not do. It looks like they're closer to uh, Google's Pixel because they have a dual pixel camera. I'm very excited about the low light, and they're doing something Apple can't do on the new S9, which is 960 frames per second, super slow mo, and that's attractive. What is the reaction you're hearing from Barcelona, Michael? Well, I think most people are excited about, oddly enough, the uh, an emoji ripoff. So you oh, not come on! Apple, but, but they are. They that's have what that's what they're copying. Apple is the an emoji, oh. the one. Yeah, people love people love these things, and uh, and frankly, I like them. They're they're a lot of fun. Um, so I'm excited to actually play with that um, when the when the phone gets back to New York. Um, I think generally, you know, the 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 consensus is that this isn't a leap ahead of the Galaxy S8. So if you have last year's model, there's not enough reason to go out to run out and get the S9. But they're they're still building on a very solid foundation. You know, Samsung has nearly perfected this Galaxy series with the uh, with the edge to edge display. I think a lot of people like the um, the performance, obviously, on the cameras and low light settings. Um, you know, the the display itself is really nice. The, the phone looks uh, very premium. So uh, people still consider this uh, one of the best Android phones available. It's just, um, you know, it, it's not really pushing the boundary uh, in the same way that the iPhone 10 is like is trying to you know guess where uh, where phones are headed in the future. Mm. So so this doesn't quite set the same benchmark, but it's still a very good phone. The Animoji feature uh, the, that they demonstrated on stage did not feature aliens, monkeys, lions. It just took your picture and turned it into something that vaguely looked like you. But is there more to it than that? 
No, that's it. That's it. But people love doing that. I mean, like people do that on the Nintendo uh, Wii. They do that uh, through Bitmoji. I mean, and people are obsessed with themselves. But I guess so, that's the uh, point is I could do this with Bitmoji on a snap on Snapchat on any well, phone, right? Well, you, you could, but you can't do this actually animates. So okay. Bitmoji uh, right now. It doesn't you can't just, talk and have its lips move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I think, um, you know, I'm sure Snapchat has the capability to do this. Obviously, they have like 3D renders of your Bitmoji in Snapchat. But this is um, one of the only apps or, or features that lets you um, control a 3D avatar much like you would with a puppet or something like that. So it's just it's a fun, stupid feature. But uh, and so it, it's like not you shouldn't go buy the phone just because of this one thing. Um, however, it's a nice addition, I think, if, if you decide to buy it. I can tell you, I have the Animoji on the iPhone 10, and I used it a few times at the beginning when I first got it. I've never even thought of using it again. Maybe that's just because I'm an old person. It's the same like the with me. I used it, it once. It yeah, it's gimmicky. Yeah. I don't. What, what yeah. do I want to send an animated tiger for? <laughs> so <laughs> I want to know, like, Explode Gate. Like, you know, last year they kind of brought their uh, the milliamps of the battery down a little bit. Did they amp it up this year? Did they? Are they betting big on the battery again? Or are they worried it's going to explode? Um, so I, I can't say off the top of my head what the size of the battery can. is. I know that I memorized all the stats: three thousand <laughs> milliamp hours for the S nine and for the S nine plus thirty five hundred. That's still a lot below. I think the Note seven was four thousand. Yeah, I was going to say, I think they haven't gone quite up to the same yeah. uh, capacity as, yeah. as the, the Note 7 that was exploded. Do you find it amazing? I thought after the Note Gate, after the Note 7, Samsung would really hurt that this okay. would be a big deal. It did not seem to impact them at all. They immediately, the very next quarter, they had a massive quarter with the S8 and the Note 8. Nobody held back. Uh <laughs> I guess people believed, as I, I think is probably the case, that Samsung will be extra. This is the least likely phone to explode now. Well, there's not a lot of competition in the marketplace, though, right? So, I no, mean, it's Samsung and Apple, and that's it, right? Right. So, I mean, if you're not, you know, if, if you're interested in Android, they're just, there are other models, but... Um, I prefer the Google Pixels, but uh, you're right. Most well, people... They're having a hard time. Poorly, though. Are they doing that badly? Oh, the Pixel yeah, 2 is... Yeah. Because it's like uh, an abomination. I think it was only like three million <laughs> units sold worldwide or something. That's so it was, sad. It was, oh, wow. It's easily the best. Having a hard time with hardware. I just I yeah. think that they just don't have it together. Um, they, they've they've tried to be a hardware company a few times now, and it's just not. Uh, you know, Samsung not spends uh, unlike most other companies. Its marketing dollar is tied to its revenue. So as they as they roll in the dough, and they really are rolling in the dough. They buy more ads, and you'll see more Samsung ads everywhere than anything. Hmm. So, I mean, even even Apple, which buys a lot of ads, you'll see Samsung's marketing everywhere. And obviously, that's overcome any uh, concerns people have. And yeah, maybe it's there's just no competition. Although there is competition, it's just people aren't choosing it. Well, I and think many Xiaomi people rely on Samsung some... for the creation oh. of um, of OLED panels, and and I think the production process. Um, for a long time has been something that Samsung has really cornered the market on. So they're one of the, you know, the biggest phone manufacturers. And so the success and of the And they make the connection. screens. They even make the screens for Apple. That's right. Well, and yeah. here's, and, Samsung has sort of greater brand penetration because they're not just making phone, like HTC has a problem, has many problems, but HTC has a problem because you don't buy other HTC products. Right. You know, people have Samsung refrigerators and washing machines, yeah. you know, so it's a, it's a brand with much higher capacity and, and greater penetrations. So I think even if they falter, there's so many other products in the marketplace that people do like, um, and they're so far ahead in other areas like IOT. I just, you know, yeah. Uh, Brianna, you started to yeah. say uh, Xiaomi oh. makes some good phones, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I don't know if you guys watch the YouTube channel Unbox Therapy, but they, yeah, they bring out, a, oh, he's amazingly yeah. talented, but they bring out a lot of these phones that, you know, we just don't hear about if you watch, you know, This Week in Tech or The Verge or other things like that every week. And, you know, I've been really impressed with the quality of them when i've seen them in person like some of the um the chinese people i know uh here in boston like it's i think it's a bigger brand in china than in the united states yeah yeah we, but what about the u.s in intelligence agencies have advised against purchasing <laughs> right. phones from huawei and, yeah. Huawei and there Xiaomi. Was, yeah they could potentially be spying on you so yeah um in fact, well, huawei had a deal it's very sad 
Huawei had a deal for their new phone with both AT&T and Verizon. And after the U.S. government said, no, 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 both AT&T and Verizon pulled out. And Huawei was, you know, devastated. They said, if you don't have a carrier deal in the U.S., you don't sell phones. Yep. Is it? Do you actually now this is an interesting question. All, all, I mean, all the iPhones are made in China. Is there something about a Huawei or a Xiaomi or uh, uh, that that makes it more inherently more risky than a phone that's from an American company made in China? Ooh. What do you think, Michael? I think it it comes down to the software that's packaged with the phone. So I, I, it's a phenomenal question. I mean, you know, I think theoretically, you know, all phones that. Um, that begin from the same origin would be um, you, it would would have the same risk. Um, yeah, what's to stop people to go from going into Foxconn, unbeknownst yeah. to Apple, and saying, I mean, after all, this company is a Chinese company, and saying to them, "Here's a little something extra you'd be putting in the phone. Thank you very much. Don't tell Apple." Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a great point. I I, um, I imagine that there are pretty strict quality assurance. You know, Apple uh, is probably has people there watching for exactly that. <laughs> yeah, and also testing the device, the devices in the U.S. You right. know, once they reach the U.S., I'm sure that they have a team of engineers that are right. trying these things out. So, uh, and we should so, point out that Samsung's phones are not made in China; they're made in Korea. I I feel like I have to add to that. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say I feel like I have to add to that. You know, I did a um, a uh, piece on the FISA bill, which is an absolute disaster for HuffPo a few weeks ago. And I was speaking with the EFF about like, um, you know, does is it theoretically possible for Congress to pass laws in back channel saying Apple has to do A, B, or C to their phone? Um, you know, could is we it? be having that kind of policy here? The answer is we don't know. The answer is flat out, we don't know. If they did have something like that, we wouldn't be able to know. So, um, you know, like if I get elected, I will certainly say what I can. But I think it's worth saying, like, people could have that same legitimate fear against states, especially because we literally just have this big FISA bill uh, renewed, which gives us right. broad powers to spy on the entire planet. In secret. And that's the, yeah, that's the important part is that a national security letter often says, and you can't tell anybody we told exactly. you this. Yep, you have three judges on the FISA court that theoretically can give some pushback and we can read some of their rulings. But as far as it being transparent for the public, no. Um, it's really scary the more you learn about it. There is a certain hypocrisy in us complaining, for instance, that the Russians impacted our elections <laughs> when we have been for a hundred years impacting elections all over the world. It's just, uh, you know, we, we didn't think of using Facebook to do it. <laughs> Here's a story that was big in Reuters uh, this week. Apple moves to store iCloud keys in China, raising human rights fears. Ooh. But the, but I have to say, this is not... I mean, Apple is a company doing business in China. Any company doing business in China is required to obey the laws of China, just as any company doing business in the U.S. is required to obey our laws. And incidentally, guess where the iCloud keys are stored in the U.S.? They're stored at Apple, and they will get, hand them over to law enforcement. They, uh, given a FISA request, an NSL letter, or a, a simple subpoena or warrant. Uh, so and this is it's no different, this, in other words. Well, I think there's a, there's there's a key difference. You know, it, I, so I lived in China for a while, and in China, you don't have a reasonable expectation of of privacy, even if you're. Um, pretty digital, digitally savvy and, and sort of uh, on the higher end of the income spectrum. That is, you know, in the United States, people are sort of blindly using the packaged software that and the, the tools and the systems that come with their computers and their, you know, cell phones, you know, and I don't think the average person who uses Keychain understands what that is and uh, where the data is and who has access to the data, um, you know, and so we sort of blindly click buttons and follow answers here. And we lack a certain amount of skepticism that, and so, you know, sort of seems a little counterintuitive, but um, I think people who were, who would be using the service in China are a little bit more street savvy. Um, yeah. when so it comes they're to safer is what you're saying than Americans who trust I'm Apple. More, I'm saying they're more aware. And <laughs> I would, I would be surprised if you know, they're, 
it's been my experience that um, in the digital realm, at least, people are a lot less naive so in funny. China. Yeah. And China's a huge com- country, so it's not everybody, but it seems to be a, a greater sophistication there among sort of the average user, in my experience, than, I've, than I observe here in the United States. Well, and so I think the, I the, the, the average of, person's... Uh, the go average ahead, Michael, and then Brianna, go ahead. Yeah. So, sorry, the, the average person's relationship with the government and how they use technology and what they're able to see and not see, I think, is much different in China uh, when you compare it to the average U.S. citizen. So, of course, the government is spying on uh, on American citizens, but not in the same capacity that China is spying on and clamping down on. Do we know that? Ideas behind the, the, well, there's layers. The so yeah. Do we know that, though? We don't know it because of the FISA bill. We don't know what the American government is doing. We don't have a culture of um, sort of layers upon layers upon layers of a sort of information network where there are tendrils that may span up through prefectural um, governors. You know, it's it's it's, a, it's different here. Let me let me let me ask you this: since you've lived there, Amy, uh, this month the Wall Street Journal had this article about the Chinese police adding facial recognition right. glasses that mm-hmm. they can walk around. And they can see people and they get immediate facial recognition. This is the kind of thing Google Glass, uh, people were worried about Google Glass because now do the average Chinese citizen, I mean, you did this in America. Well, that'd be a big deal. Does the average well, Chinese they, citizen look at this and say, oh, that's good. We're going to be safer. Or do they say, oh, that's terrible. A couple things. First of all, this, this, is, this has been reported as though this is some kind of groundbreaking new technology in the 2000. Eight, I think it was World Cup. Um, this exact technology was, and, and, a, and a much slower version of it, of course, and, and and less powerful. But it was already in use, and it was being tested to sort of predetermine who the rabble rousers right. are, uh, right. who's likely to cause problems. China has a very different attitude towards privacy than a lot of other places do around the world. So there are already systems where if you jaywalk, you know, you're there's there's facial recognition everywhere. So if you if you jaywalk. Your face is shown on a on a sort of digital billboard with your name and your employer, and you know it's the purpose of it is to, is to publicly shame you. Is it um, is that tre- considered a good thing or a bad thing? It's my sense that at least in some parts of China, that's considered a good thing. That's like, yes, that's keeping order. That's I mean, right. Think about from the other end, though. Like you would never have something like GamerGate in China with people sending hundreds and hundreds you and couldn't. hundreds There's of no anonymity. death threats. Yeah. And they take a lot of pride in that. You know, I've talked to my father-in-law about this. It's just it's a different culture with different uh, you know priorities there. I I did want to say about the Apple. Um, you you said Apple keeps the encrypted keys stored here in the United States. Are you talking about? The we're talking about the the file iCloud. that your iCloud with all of your passwords. We're not talking about your public and private key to actually decrypt everything yes. in iCloud. So correct? remember, during San Bernardino, okay. Apple said to the FBI, "No, we won't decrypt the phone." However, if you had just thought to bring the phone to the guy's house, because it's probably syncing to iCloud, most iPhones do. We'd be glad to hand over his iCloud data. Oh. Apple, Apple has never, they've, they don't like to talk about it, but they've never hidden the fact that they've always had access to your iCloud data. Dropbox has access to your Dropbox data. It's not, Google has access to Google Drive data. That's typical in these situations. Your key does not protect you. It's, it's. Right. I don't know why this is a mystery to everybody. You're it seems to be. <laughs> but, it, but it shouldn't be. Um, but that's why this headline is interesting to me. Apple moves to store iCloud keys in China. Well, of course, the Chinese say if you're going to store data of Chinese citizens, it better be stored in China, including the key. Just as here in the United States, Apple stores iCloud keys in the U.S. and it's available to law enforcement, as it would be in China. I, I guess I incorrectly assumed that that would be encrypted because you kind of trust Apple encrypted. to do the right thing. Okay, so it is encrypted, so they have to break the no, encrypted China, file. No, Apple the has the key. Okay, Apple well, has well, the key. Isn't, well, isn't the point that if a Chinese government official wanted to look at a citizen's iCloud account, They it would be easier for them to do that now that uh, the keys are based in China rather than having to deal with like the U.S. legal system. Yes. And so, so that was my takeaway. It was just that but it's going to be much the, easier for yes, human rights. Yes, but you're a U.S. company doing business in China. It would be, uh, Just as we would demand that it be... <laughs> right? But you've got to follow the rules of the, the right. local place. I mean, and again, like I just... Uh, I, I there's there's a level of sophistication. I think there's a, a um, elite. 
I, I think I, I would be surprised if people are storing copious amounts of very you know sensitive private data on you know in China they would know better. China. Yeah, is that's what right. you're saying. That's fair. I mean, yeah. not everybody, but yes, that's that would be my. So impression. in a way, we're more vulnerable in the U.S. because the general impression in the U.S. is, oh no, it's an iCloud. Apple protects my privacy. It's safe. Life is a lot easier here, and it gets you know, and uh, we just lack we lack um, the skepticism that I see in other places, and we sort of blindly follow the uh, the edicts that we see on our screens, without stopping to think for a few minutes about the consequences. So, right. and it is the case that China's process for looking at that data is different here in the United States. You need a legal uh, entity with a warrant or a subpoena or an NSL uh, in China. It's not quite as difficult for authorities to demand those keys. Court approval isn't required under Chinese law, so the police can just do it. Now, here's something interesting. The GDPR goes into play in Europe uh, in a couple months. This is a huge sweeping privacy yes. regulation. Yeah. And so I, I'm sort of now curious to find out how, uh, how Keychain, how does that work going forward? I mean, uh -huh. how many different... You know what I mean? So yeah. just from a practical point of view, like how many times do you have, have to authenticate and how do they ensure the encryption and so that it still meets the standards of all that, that regulation? Yeah, because businesses are required to protect that personal data. Right. Uh, that's very interesting, isn't it? I imagine yeah. the EU will require that iCloud data be stored in... Or Europe. maybe that's why they're doing it in China. I don't know. Or maybe that's partly why it's... You know, maybe everybody's in Europe will have their data stored in China to get around some of just the complicated issues. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I, I there are a lot of um, there's a cloud service, Dropbox like service called Trezor, it T R E S O R I T, and they trumpet. We're in Switzerland, <laughs> <laughs> so you're safe. <laughs> but that worked uh, out really well for everybody's bank accounts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I think in 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 general, in the long run, uh, the trend is uh, away from GDPR. But I'm actually at first I was a little skeptical of of EU regulation of uh, American companies, but now I'm starting to think they're the last. That's the last stand. That's our last chance to protect our privacy. I, don't I mean, know I've had a lot of talks it. about how we would pass something like an omnibus privacy bill here in the United States. And is there like, interest uh, in that? Is there? I'm sorry, I missed that. Is there an interest in that? Is that going to happen? I I think there is with consumers, and especially the people that donate to my campaign. The question is, like, could we actually get something like that through Congress? Because it's not. I don't think uh, from the lawyers I've talked to, the tax subcommittee would have the um, authority to you know do that. So you know, I think. What I think we need in the United States is I think we need to realize that most of our laws about privacy uh, and online behavior were passed in the 90s. And I think we need a fresh look at that. I just don't know if this Congress will ever have the will to do something serious. So I think when you're looking to Europe, if they're taking step forwards, you know, I'll take that. GDPR I... goes into effect in May. And I would bet there'll be quite a reckoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, this is this is this is not. Uh, um, so so I've been talking about this for a while. You know, we're gonna wind up with a series. We're gonna wind up with a splintered internet, right? Where we have yeah. we have um, internets that are defined different versions of the internet with different versions of content that's defined by geographic borders, which is gonna make our current fake news nightmare a a, a insurmountable headache. But um, it also makes it, you know, the cost of doing business, the practicalities of doing business. I mean, it's just, it could exponentially change in a, in a sort of very negative way how all of us access information and each other, right? So that, that's, 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 you know, and I don't know if, if even more regulation, regulation in absence of, you know, sort of helping people gain digital literacy, Right. So, so the laws haven't changed in the 90s, but I, I don't think a lot of people have changed either in their approach to um, what they're sharing and how they're sharing information and what their expectations for their privacy is. And, you know, we, some of the onus has got to be on us, too. It, just, it can't just all be about regulation. I, you know, I, I understand that point and I really understand where you're coming from. But I think when you look at something like Facebook, I don't think Facebook is ever going to change. I think we can write all the headlines in the world, shaming them about their business practices. I don't think they're ever going to do the right thing. I think Facebook has grown so large and I think their leadership is really divorced from the reality of the octopus that they've created. Talk to people that own media companies like 
Facebook has really, really, really been bad for most media companies. And I think you look at their role in the election and a real failure to have accountability about Russians buying ads on their platform. You know, here in Boston, if a Russian bought an ad for a certain political candidate, that television station would be in jail. And the fact that we don't have those same laws online, I think we've got to take a fresh look at this. And I, I tell you, I really get it. I understand it for as someone that's run a business. It's really bizarre to be running for office and to start being the one talking about regulation. I just don't see like a lot of these companies ever doing the right thing. It's very challenging. So I agree with you, Amy, that uh, individuals are responsible. But at the same time, companies like Facebook should, I don't think, should be allowed to run roughshod over people's privacy. Yeah. And the problem is that anytime we try to th here's the problem with regulation, regulation and policy are written by people um, in such a way to, to, so that so that it passes. Right. And, and what you wind up with is highly specific limiting language because anything that's too broad, um, you know, can't can't make its way through. And so we just constantly have regulation that's out like the moment yeah. that it gets Instantly. passed, it's outdated. Yeah. Right. So is the political process you're saying is inadequate to do this? I'm saying we need to work. I mean, l listen, Brianna, I totally, you know, I support you and I, I, um, <laughs> it would be awesome if you got to Congress and made some positive changes. That'd be amazing. But, but, you know, we also just as individuals need to, uh, need to come up with some workarounds and, um, you yeah, know, it may end up being, I mean, ultimately, that's also the solution to fake news that people say, well, it's really going to be up to individuals. You can't stop fake news. It's going to be up to each and every one of us to be I, more I critical. But at the same time, I, I think the reason the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, exists is because the United States has abrogated its duty. A GDPR is aimed at American companies. Sure. That's right. I, I feel like I do just want to add one point of fact here. I think um, I, I would encourage people, I, I understand the fear that like if you got all of Congress to vote on a technology bill, my God, those people have no idea what they're talking about. I understand that. But the way that Congress works and the way that the Senate works is when you're elected, you get assigned to certain uh, subcommittees. Like Al Franken was assigned to the judiciary. I hope to serve on the technology subcommittee. And then you have a group of interested people, hopefully with some career experience in that field to kind of read about an issue and understand it. So so it's not like this hodgepodge of like useless stuff. So I do think that when I do think that government at its best can write good law that is well informed by the facts. I just think currently the people serving on that all too often serve powerful corporations as we have seen with our discussion on net neutrality. You know, Verizon and AT&T sure gave those people a lot of money for their elections. Yeah, I don't want to throw out the political process because if you if you say, well, the, it, the political process is inadequate to it, then you have zero regulation. Is that a Amy? Is that what you're proposing? No, the the challenge is. So my my job is to think very very far into the future, right? So the problem is that um, you know right now, so deep fakes. We all remember, you know, what started the, por the porno swapping. fakes with yeah. people's faces, right? Yeah. right. So here's the problem. This this raised all these thorny issues that I haven't heard anybody discuss, um, and they they they, you know, and, and as a result, so first of all, who owns your face? Well, that's not clear. Um, I went through with a fine tooth comb all of Facebook's terms of service and every part of the website uh, that addresses um, nudity and people, you know, th that would have addressed um, the issue of deep fakes. Same thing for Twitter. Twitter. Uh, under, you know, nowhere. So basically nobody broke the terms of service um, on Twitter. And for Facebook, did you guys see that if you feel like you've been a victim of revenge porn or of deep fakes, their uh, solution at the moment, the last that I read was that you have to, you have to use Facebook Messenger to send in a completely nude photo of yourself. Yes. That was yeah, their proposal. Right? That was a nutty so idea. That, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's being piloted in Australia, as yeah. far as I know. Yeah. So, I mean, here's so here's the problem. The problem is that the platforms are constantly absolving themselves of any blame. They're saying um, we're platforms. We're not responsible. That's right. But although, our well, so, so here's but here's the problem. Um, 
you know, who owns your face? Who owns what gets to be done with your face? If your face is you, if you, how do you get your face back? Right. And, and I could, I could list like 20 legal questions for which we have no answers and there's no debate and there's no policy and, you know, nobody's discussing that. And I could do the same thing for, you know, various aspects of machine learning and who owns these different parts of your data and, and the decisions that are made. Well, get I mean, ready for you know, H.R. 1865, allowing states and victims to fight online sex trafficking act of 2017, which in effect makes websites responsible for the content posted on the website. It is a complete overreaction, but it means that every website will be responsible for anything that is posted on that website. Which it, will become a First Amendment fight because um, somebody will make the case that uh, it's it's limiting, you know, it's, it's hindering and, and unnecessarily limiting the, the expression of free speech in the comment section. A I provider mean, of an interactive computer service that publishes information, I'm reading from it, provided by an information content provider with reckless disregard that the information is in furtherance of a sex trafficking offense shall be subject to a criminal fine or imprisonment for not more than 20 years. Mm. And, Great. Uh, so who's going to enforce? I mean, good luck enforcing. <laughs> here's the problem. No, but here's the problem. So the deep fake sites. So it takes like three. You know, uh, motherboards did really great reporting on this. So if this is something listeners are interested in, I would I would strongly suggest you you take a look at their reporting. You know, so so here's the thing. Um, finally, Pornhub and finally Reddit take down right. the thread. Where, where this is all being discussed and how to guides are, are being shown. But there are clones everywhere, everywhere. You can, you can throw a rock on the internet and hit a website where you can find somebody who's willing to make a deep fake for you, you know, because out of the goodness of their heart uh, or for, you know, a fraction of Bitcoin. So I, the problem is you can't, you can't regulate an idea. And that's the problem that we keep coming back to in the United States over and over again. That is our current problem with the Second Amendment. That's going to become a problem with our Fifth Amendment and various different kinds of technologies. It's the problem with deep fakes. Once the idea is out there, it's very, very difficult to, to draw it back in. And all of the technology that makes us so productive and enhances our lives in so many ways, you know, can fork and, and take us all in a different direction. That's that's the problem. Uh, I, I, kind of, I, I yeah. I, I hate to say, but I, I sort of disagree with that, the notion that uh, that you can't regulate or stop an idea. You know, like um, I think you can look at even just like copyrighted um, MP3 sharing. You know, that was something that was a problem. I think people identified it. Uh, some people made the case that you're making now, which is like, well, cat's out of the bag. People know how to share peer to peer and the Internet's only getting faster. The demand for audio is only getting uh, is only growing. And so uh, the second Napster came on the scene, you couldn't put all of this stuff back into uh, into the box. Uh, the reality is that we've kind of solved that issue now. You know, most people use streaming services rather than um, rather than downloading illegal MP3s as, as they once did. I think in the case of deep fakes, you know, you can't. Um, you can't make an idea illegal, but you can make the act of creating fake pornography illegal. I don't think that's out that's of line. That's not the or issue. Even sure, of you you could totally do that. My point is that there will that's like fighting last yesterday's war, right? So sure, we legislators could get together tomorrow and come up with a you know the house could pass a, a anti deep fake bill. That the the problem is that in order to get that legislation through, you're using language for something that's already happened, not for the next. You know, third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth things that'll happen. And just going back to to the MP3 sharing for a minute the, and the just piracy the process. Well, but you know, so so Canada has legislation on the books that makes it illegal and finable for anybody to post anything that's pirated on Google. So if I search in Canada on something and and I see a pirated version of it come up, that's illegal, and that's in direct response to the fact that they are they you know, you may not you know so so peer to peer file sharing may not have. Um, may not be super popular in the United States anymore because people can stream, but that's not the case elsewhere in the world, right? And that's that we keep losing perspective on, uh, you know, just because something no longer is attractive or popular here in the United States, you know, we have this sort of recency phenomenon where we forget that maybe things are not, you know, maybe things are a little different elsewhere. Um, of course, but we're talking about U.S. policy and, and, and lawmakers, yeah. uh, you know, taking responsibility for the things that are happening online. I think, um, you know, as you said, like 
sure they're they're solving a problem that is sort of that's already happened in there and and they're sort of losing ground on the next big um the next big battle here but but i think that's kind of how that's kind of how law the the law system works or like the the political system works you know we can't the lawmaker's job is not to predict um you know future crimes i mean to some extent oh, I totally you know, some, totally some, disagree <laughs> i totally disagree we we had we've had offices um whose express job it was to and that is what strategic foresight is to map out um, given what we know to be true today and all of the data that we have, what's likely coming and to monitor that and then write policy uh, so that we can keep track. I mean, technology is evolving so quickly that it can no longer keep up with, I'm sorry, that the you know policy can no longer keep up with technology the way that it has in the past. And just really quickly on the internet. So <laughs> we don't see the internet as sort of a, a as the commons, the same way that we do the the air overhead, right? So, so with different ecological and environmental issues, we have um, multinational stakeholder groups where there are global scale regulations, and you know, not entirely enforceable in the way that a traditional law might be. You know, if you if you break that, that that the penalties may be enforceable, but but we we absolved ourselves of that with the internet. So there is no, you know, there there are different groups here and there, but we don't have global treaties. We don't have global regulatory policy. So even if we were to pass a law in the United States and it became illegal to create a deep fake, you know, here, there's nothing preventing somebody from doing that exact same thing and having it show up in the exact same way, you know, as long as they were outside of the boundaries of the United States. So I, so I feel like I need to add something here because this isn't hypothetical for me. I actually, I know the people at the very forefront of working on this area of legislation. Her name is Marianne Frank. She's one of the most brilliant lawyers in the United States. I've worked with her on this at Harvard. And she herself, like the person that's on the forefront in trying to figure out the legal apparatus for fighting this, she's not 100% on the side of government regulation. Like she talks to Google all the time about updating their policies. She talks to Reddit, she talks to Facebook, then she goes and tries to work with local law, like here in Massachusetts, she wants to give prosecutors more power. So I think with all respect to your point, I understand like globally, there's not one single solution you can point to. What something like this is going to require is exactly what Marianne is doing. She's looking at the problem from a large legislative uh, point of view, and she's walk, working with all the involved actors. So, like Google, if Google will like remove certain things from the search results because they agree it's a uh, an invasion of privacy, then you know that reduces some of the risks. So it's it's a very difficult problem to solve. Like just talk to her. She spends all of her time doing this. But I mean, I certainly think you're seeing her move forward on that. And I think the situation with revenge porn is much better than it was five years ago because she didn't like shrug her shoulders. Like she got in there and worked with the law and started making a difference here. It's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it's sorry, a big challenge sorry. and, and yes. you know we don't want I, I i frankly think it's virtually intractable and yet I, you don't want to give up you need to try to make some steps you need to try to do something because the uh, the alternative is to give up you're not saying we should give up amy you're saying we should think no, no. more be more i'm saying forward we thinking. That's absolutely right. I'm I'm not saying to give up, and I don't mean to sound like a fatalist. Um, what I am saying is, you know, the the problems that we are going to face over the next ten to twenty years are nothing. You know, are are orders of magnitude more complicated than than we've seen thus far, and it's going to require very smart people like you know, like Brianna, um, and like you know. I think that the, there's a new crop of people who are running for Congress. Um, there are people who are in Congress who are very smart. There's people who are writing policy. It's just going to require a different approach. And there, there is an inherent tension between the way that we have always created policy and law and the current um, ways in which we share information and use technology. I would, I would to, submit that you, you are know, a stakeholder in this, Amy. Your focus is in the future. That absolutely has to be considered. The women who are today victims of repent, revenge porn and, and fakes also are a stakeholder and need to be considered. 
the challenge, Brianna, that your friend faces is you also have to consider Google. You have to consider kind of bad ideas like FOSTA, which is going to be, by the way, HR 1865 is going to be voted on on Tuesday. This is not hypothetical. It's not in committee. This is going to be, this is about to vote. These The H House of Representatives is about to vote on this. This is a bad idea, and there are plenty of those as well. But I think we need to find a way forward. And uh, the sad fact, well, maybe that's a hopeful fact. I don't know. The fact of the matter is we are faced right now because of the speed uh, that technology is changing our lives in so many ways with artificial intelligence, uh, you know, uh, self-driving cars, uh, free speech. We are faced with very difficult challenges. That's why, by the way, Brianna, I hope you win. And I hope you understand what you're getting yourself into because this is a mess. And I, I look at that bill you just mentioned, Leah. I would vote against that bill, and I, I would have no problem with that. And yeah. I know I would take it's a, a lot of heat solution. for that. It's a bad solution. Yeah, it's a terrible solution. Yeah. But I, I would say this. You know, all respect to the generation that's older than me. I do think that eventually new generations come up and take the helm. And it's, it's my hope. Maybe this is idealistic, but it's my hope that like the next generation is going to have less of a ruthless approach to problem solving <laughs> and maybe maybe we can like change the culture in congress yeah. you know it certainly less of a scorched ed, less now, of a scorched right? uh, earth approach anyway yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, pr we're so uh, unfortunately uh, polarized over this it's impossible to make uh, headway in any direction we had a very yeah. good uh, interview on friday on triangulation with andrew keen who's for a long time said the internet is broken <laughs> and has written a new book on what we need to do to fix it. And essentially that's his position. He says, uh, this is very similar to the industrial revolution where you had uh, technologists and you have them today who are very hopeful that technology will just solve all of this. There's no need for regulation. It'll all be fixed. There'll be universal income. Everything will be super cheap. It's all going to be fine. Don't worry. There are the, the naysayers who say this is all a mess Let's destroy the looms. <laughs> let's go back to the past. <laughs> well, let's get kerosene and light the homes that way. And then there's the, he calls them the maybes, the, the people in the middle. And this is what you need to be. This is what we all need to be. People who understand this is a very difficult problem, but not throw up their hands, not assume that it's going to happen by itself, but actually dig in and have these discussions and see what we can do to fix it. And you can't expect agreement. Yeah. And, and I guess I worry, one of the things that worried me, that, Amy, that you said was that the, the, the legislative process is essentially political. It is about compromise, but that is a, that's a necessity. I don't think you can write the perfect law. Do you think that that's it? That, no, that, I mean, that's listen, a failing said, that's not, that means it won't have, it won't work. I was at the state of the net, uh, which, so there's this conference that happens in uh, this gathering, annual gathering in DC. Um, and I don't know if over the first two hours, I, I must've heard the word bot, like, you know, uttered by, senators and, you know, really, really like top level people. And I, and I got to the point where it was like, I, I don't think everybody understands what they're, that word means. I don't, what I don't you think, think it means. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And here's why I found that so concerning because if our, and I don't expect every lawmaker to have a, a very high level understanding, you know, deep level understanding of all different technologies that they could possibly regulate. However, um, our legislative process is necessarily slow, and that's a good thing. We don't want our laws changing, yes. you know, every five yes. seconds. The, the the challenge, however, is that technology is becoming complex, and it is presenting us with questions that we have never had to ask or an answer before. You know, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's not just automation. That for me. This is the area of, that I research. The thing for me that's most concerning has to do with autonomous decision making, you know, by machines that don't share conscious, don't have consciousness the way that we do. So yeah. machines are going to, you know, are making sort of non-conscious decisions, which is which will be the first time in humanity that's that's ever happened. And the problem is that questions like who owns your face, right, um, will seem childish today, you know, compared with the direction that we're headed in. And if I have a lawmaker who five years after the fact is having a hard time explaining to a group of technologists what a bot is, that signifies to me that we need to come up with, um, you know, we need f for sort of the um, grand scale, uh, you know, issues in society, our, our current system works, you know, works. 
But when it comes to technology, we need to think of we need to think of alternate methods to have faster, smarter conversations, <laughs> stakeholders who are not just tied to the commercial sector and who are not totally politicized. Right. It's a tall order, but it's a very but tall order. And I, my fear is that right. if you get too negative about it, then uh, what happens is, is uh, you, you, you leave the democratic process behind because sure. <laughs> an authoritative pro authoritarian process is very good at handling this and uh, can move very quickly. Maybe China's not. Doing quite well. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe that's not the right answer either. No. Yeah. Uh, Michael Nunez is here from uh, Mashable. Did you, I'm going to give you the final word, Michael, because we've been hogging the conversation. <laughs> no, before no, we it, take it's a break. Really interesting. I mean, Isn't I'm, it fascinating? Also, and I, I, yeah. I, I'm trying not to get depressed by it. Yeah, I, I also I kind of forgot I was on the show for a second. I was yeah. back and listening. Uh, <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm listening. Yeah, really, two smart really people here. Yeah. Um, I think just to clarify my point, you know, it, it's not that lawmakers shouldn't be thinking about the future. Of course, they should be doing that. But laws are often written based on precedent, right? So it's things happen and then lawmakers react. And I, I think that's just uh, the sort of realistic expectation that that I've come to learn. Um, I think you know to Amy's point about what to expect in the future. I think it's the PP tape. I think it's the Donald Trump P tape. I'm surprised that that hasn't surfaced already. What I'm does this sure have to do with the P tape? Well, <laughs> I think it doesn't matter. Let's talk about it. Which may or may not exist. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, well, it, it probably. Uh, who knows whether it exists uh, in reality? But but things like deep fakes and and um, and AI uh, generated. Do you think, do you think it's, it's, we're being set up so that they can say that's a fake if it should emerge? Is that what you're saying? I, I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, not in the conspiracy, uh, in the, in the same theory. sense that yeah. you're saying that, but, but I think that it, it would be, I think it's realistic to expect a video like that to surface. In a large, on a larger scale, here's what I think you're saying that is, I think, really important. And it's the sad state of affairs is that we've set up all of these things that if people are good and benevolent and wonderful, are good and benevolent and wonderful. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, on and on and on. Many of the great technologies we've created. What we didn't countenance and plan for is people who aren't good, people who are motivated in a variety of different ways, and they have discovered technology and have discovered ways to bend it that but are that's that's problematic. Always but that's always happened. With every technology, you know, it... it, it any, every technology that has always been created with benevolent purposes in mind has taken a turn for the evil. Because humans suck. Well, so what I, do you I mean, do about that? <laughs> prepare, but prepare in advance. Prepare Acknowledge for the suck it, attitude? Right? Well, yeah. No, no, but this is, this is my whole point. We have people in Washington, D.C. who are not thinking, not assuming that at some point the catastrophic scenarios are plausible. And if you're not in that headspace, I'm not saying to be negative all the time, but you have to acknowledge the possibility that these things could happen, right? Or something bad well, could happen. Well, and then acknowledge so that you can't stop it. No, what, so then let's come up What I can 100% promise you, Amy, is as someone that's doing this every single day, I absolutely promise you, they have no idea. They have no idea what deep fakes is. They have no plan I for know. this. <laughs> and they just... This is the fundamental problem is they see it as but they be see careful. people with be careful. IT knowledge as someone with that's like a backup singer that they can hire and bring in to solve yeah. the problem. Yeah. They have no stake in this yeah. problem by themselves. Yeah. And it is I'm telling you this as someone who's a software engineer and someone who like stopped to get involved and do this. And I am so depressed by the level of technological literacy that I see in government. But that's why I need everyone on Twit that's listening to this to realize the process needs you. Yeah, like get up. involved, yeah. go run for your town committee, okay. go sit on your local political party council, especially if you're a Republican. Republicans, we need Republicans that care about these issues. Like let's, the thing I've found is technologists generally agree on a certain core of things, no matter what political party we belong to. So, Amy, I really agree with you. It is worse than I possibly could have imagined, but that's why we have to not get cynical and get involved. All right, that's a good way to put it, and we're going to take a break <laughs> at that. Uh, on that note. This is a conversation that's interesting that's happening more and more on this network. I think that we are all kind of aware of this now, and we're wondering what, what to do. Uh, my fear is that we'll at some point abandon a democratic uh, policies and become a technocratic state, because I think there's a, there's going to be a, a 
a feeling at some point that only the technocrats can solve this. And the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world are going to step up and say, I'll take care of this. The Jeff Bezoses of the world said, you know, you know what? I understand how this works. Just let me take care of this. Uh, and I, I do see that as being one of the possible scenarios that respond to all of these problems that we're talking about. And it's one that I don't and uh, think would be a very uh, good path to go down. But there we go. Let's take a break. We've got a great panel. As I said, Michael Nunez from Mashable. Great to have you. Michael Brianna Wu. Congress, running for Congress. The primary has been set September 2018. If you're in the Massachusetts 8th, you know what I think. <laughs> you know who to vote for. And Amy Webb, the author of The Signals Are Talking, why today's fringe is tomorrow's mainstream. And uh, we'll be very interested to see the uh, FTI trend report when it comes out. Is there a place people could go to order it now to get on the list now? Yeah, well, it's, we give it away, so it's yeah. free. Um, so if you go to futuretodayinstitute.com, uh, there's a link to it from the front page. Fantastic. Thank you. Our show today brought to you by Audible. <laughs> if, if some of this gets you down, here's some good news. <laughs> you can listen to a great book, a work of art that can take over your life and your mind and give you respite. And believe me, I do it every single day thanks to Audible. There's plenty of time. Reading is great. and But my problem is, as I think probably a lot of you, life took over. And I, I didn't have enough time to read. But Audible fills those holes in your day where you can't hold a book, you can't read. But you are you could listen to a book when you're driving to work, when you're walking the dog, when you're doing the dishes or the yard work. And Audible is such a great solution for that. Uh I, I'm very excited about it. There's a couple of books I'm looking forward to. I already got on the wait list for this one called Tangerine. It's a novel that sounds fantastic. It's a, a pre-order. But then I do listen to a lot of uh, nonfiction as well. I mentioned that I'm I'm uh, watching rewatching HBO's Band of Brothers, and I thought, you know, I really ought to... Uh, I ought to listen to the original Stephen Ambrose book. In fact, there's a ton of Stephen. Ambrose is one of my oh, favorite really historians. Good. Isn't he great? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a ton of e Ambrose uh, works, including Band of Brothers, uh, that you can listen to. Audible always has the best narrators. That's one of the things. You might say, oh, I don't know. I don't want somebody droning into my ear. I, I, I can't listen to a book. Yes, you believe me. In some ways, listening to a book is the best way to absorb a book. Uh, mm -hmm. I, just, I just love it. And so many great books. Here's what we're going to do to get you started. If you're a little... I don't know. Is this for me? We've got a great offer for you. It's called the Gold Plus One Plan. You're going to sign up for the Gold Plus One Plan at audible.com slash twit2. Here's how it works. You're going to get two books to start and then a 30-day free trial and a book a month after that. Two books to start means you don't have to do the tough thing of picking just one. And I can tell you, that's always tough for me. I have a huge library of Audible books. I've been an Audible subscriber since the year 2000, so I have over 500 books. And I've been one since 1998. Will you uh, can beat I show me? You I'm listening to? Well, Let's what see, are you listening right? to, Brianna? All right, I've got my phone right here. Uh, Lost Camp of Girls Forever. That's really good. Lost it's a horror Camp novel. Lost Camp of Girls Forever. That sounds That's scary. Really, it's really, it's really scary. And uh, Persephone Rising, that's the new James S. A. Corey novel. Yeah, you know, The Expanse is uh, on Sci Fi Channel. Yes, it's The a Expanse good is series. so good. Oh, I love it's, it. But the books are so much better. I agree. Leviathan Wakes is probably one of the very best books on audible and so is snow crash like you should sign up oh, today yes. and just listen to those two. Oh, i love both those books and in fact oh, i have amazing both those books on audible so <laughs> i am with you a hundred percent on uh, on that and if you want something a little cheerier to to Im improve your outlook i listen i like to listen to uh non-fiction too the steven pinker book the better angels of our nature really will make you feel better about today it'll really cheer you up bill gates recently uh, picked Steven Pinker's new book as his favorite book of all time, Enlightenment Now. That's on there, too. Here's the deal. Go to audible.com slash twit2. Get yourself two free books. I think we've talked about eight now. But anyway, pick two. <laughs> and then one book credit per month. It is a great deal. 30-day free. As with all the free subscriptions, you get the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times Daily audio program. So you have more to listen to. The offer is good in the U.S. and Canada. But Audible's all over the world. So if you're in another country, don't hesitate. Try it anyway. To get two free audiobooks and a free 30-day trial, audible.com slash twit2. Audible.com slash twit2. You've been a member since 1998. Brianna, you beat me. I thought I was the king. 
No. Uh, do you remember when you had to get the Rio 500? Yeah, that's what I had too. And yeah. you got the compact flash. Before car. that, they had a proprietary thing. That I think they called the they auto. Do you remember yep. that? I do. Do you remember burning your own CDs yes, and it would yes. fail three fourths of the time? Yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, I love Audible. I started listening to audiobooks when you had to get cassettes, and that was really a lousy <laughs> experience because you only had a month for one thing and you had to mail them back. The cassettes, yep. one would break, right? And they say, oh, no problem. If one breaks, just mail it in and we'll send you a new one. But I'm stuck in the middle of the book now. I can't move on. It's frustrating. Audio is so much better when you can download it. With, with, with one of the nice things about Audible, you get the book right away. Like, yeah. If you say, oh, I got to read that, you're reading it five seconds later. So that's really nice. Audible.com slash twit2. Thank them for their support of twit. They make it all possible. All right. We should pick something more uh, cheerful. Uh, I, I, I We kind of went down a bad road there, but I think... Uh, we do that more and more lately uh, because I think that these things are coming up more and more often, frankly. This has become uh, one of the issues in our lives. Um, well, I think people are feeling anxious. Yes. Um, I wonder why. <laughs> well, but I mean, we're, we're, we're in this sort of, we sort of crossed over into this weird territory. And I think regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, you know, after the, the last election, I think things have we're sort of in unfamiliar territory, and um, I think people are just feeling it more anxious in general, you know, well, on technology and the environment, you know, yeah. economy and politics. Yeah, I think, though, even if that hadn't if, if uh, that hadn't happened, I think people would be feeling badly right now about social media. Yeah. That certainly ex accelerated it. But I think we're starting to see this. Uh, Andrew Keene, I was talking about on Friday, uh, calls it surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. he, he says Google and Facebook, who are getting massively, you know, m there was a, a good article in the Sunday Times by Charles Duhigg, the case against face, uh, case against Google. It's so big now that it needs to be regulated, th that you just can't let a company become that dominant. I think more, I'm more worried about Amazon. And I, I think was just going to say, I'm surprised that, it, you know, Amazon is more clever. Um, That's why I'm more worried. Jeff's smart. Bezos oh is smart. Oh yeah, and if you if you stop and think about, they they don't currently butt up against any antitrust legislation or or no. laws because no. they're totally diversified. But you know, Amazon is a healthcare company. Amazon is a credit card company. Yeah. Amazon, you know. Although interesting, somebody in the chat room was uh, we were talking about the Samsung at the beginning of the show said if you go to Korea, Samsung is everywhere. They're thirty percent of the GDP. He said, my friends in Korea have a Samsung health plan. They go to a hospital run by Samsung. The school is sponsored by Samsung. Their refrigerator and washer and dryer, Samsung. Uh, you, you, I mean, I, this is certainly the case in, in other countries that the, these corporations are getting more and more dominant. Uh, in fact, remember, Korea prosecuted Samsung's uh, CEO for bribery, put him in jail. They just let him out. <laughs> Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I just, I worry that we're headed in that direction, that we're headed to, to, towards a technocracy. I really do. Here is something cheerful. See, we got in the depressing thing again. Let's talk about gadgets. 150 new emojis. Yay! <laughs> this is from Emojipedia. There's a, a party face, a woozy face. Wait a minute. Wow. There's Finally. There's a lotion bottle. There's a what? <laughs> There's a lotion bottle, too. A lotion bottle. What? I don't know what yeah. that's for. I think that goes Ooh. with the whole cosmetics kit. Cold face and hot face. Uh, gingers, you finally... Oh, good. Yes, you finally have an emoji for you, as do curly-haired people. Um, and old folks like me, <laughs> white-haired people. <laughs> and bald people. There's a picture for an emoji for you. There's a super oh, villain. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. Is that fair to say the supervillain and the superhero look a lot alike? I don't. Yeah, they really do. There is a completely weird disembodied leg. leg. Everybody needs a leg. When would you? <laughs> when do you need to? When do you need to like send somebody a leg? <laughs> like what's, yeah, the, well, what's the what's the short hand? What are you shortening in your? It's sentence? a major award. It's I run a lot. I could see myself texting my husband. This is what I need you. This is why I injured this Rub this. This is what I yeah. need you to yeah. fix. Yeah. There's also feet uh, disembodied. Now, here's a weird one. Oh Tooth God. and bone. bone. Uh, okay. Um, 
These, by the way, this is a this is an arduous process they have to go through. Uh, the emojis are determined by the Unicode committee. In fact, Jeremy Rouge, who founded Wiki or uh, Emojipedia, this video is from Emojipedia, has been on our show many times. He is part of the emoji committee. They receive uh, proposals for emoji from all over the world. They have to then narrow them down and approve them. They're looking for emojis that are of universal international import and uh, a lab coat and goggles, sure. A uh, hiking boot and a flat. <laughs> <laughs> that is a paramecium. You're, <laughs> and there's a mosquito and a parrot. A, a badger and a peacock. A swan and a strange black and white raccoon. Is that a Japanese raccoon, a Chinese raccoon? <laughs> I've never seen a raccoon look like that. By the way, these renderings are not official. This is just what uh, the Unicode committee uh, proposes as a reference. But everybody, Twitter, Google, Facebook, they all, Apple, all design their own. And they won't look just like this. Kangaroo. Okay, now Andy Anako on our MacBreak Weekly show, was a, he's a New Englander. He had to point out that lobster has been cooked. It's that is not that is not a healthy lobster. That is a cooked lobster because it's bright red. Oh, maybe we need a green lobster. Let's see. We'll see if Apple does one that's not cooked. Uh, a hippopotamus, and that, the leg makes its strange reappearance. Now it's a hip. It's that hippopotamus has got long, luxurious legs. It's a very oh. elegant hippo, as is the llama. Uh, there's food: leafy greens, cupcakes, and bagels. There's a moon cake. Really? What is that? I don't know. Couldn't tell you. That, yeah, that's a, there's a holiday where you, where you eat them. <laughs> it could just be a pie. It could be a pie. <laughs> but I think that it's an egg in the middle or something. There's something there going on there. It's like Mardi Gras king cake. Yeah, it could be like a king cake. Salt. Everybody needs salt. A compass and luggage. Bricks and a skateboard. Lacrosse and a flying disc, a.k.a., we should point out, Frisbee. There's a Jace jigsaw puzzle, chess pawn, softball, magnet, toolbox. Hey, did they post a list of the rejects? Yeah, sometimes Jeremy <laughs> will talk about them. There have been some very... I'm so curious. Yeah. Let me see if they... If they like, there's the, there's your lotion, lotion bottle, by the yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. Abacus and fire extinguisher. Let's see what Abacus. the rejects... See if... Uh, this is... These are, these are really what matter is these textual descriptions... Uh, because that, so in fact, well, they do call it a super villain and a superhero. So maybe oh. there'll be a better distinguish, distinguishing uh, characteristics. Safety pins, sponge, infinity, pirate flag. Um, let me see if he mentions the rejects. When when Jeremy comes on, he always talks about the rejects, but I don't see that on the on the article in Emojipedia. But yes, yeah, so, yeah, just know. to talk about something positive that's working. I think our standards committees They're are working, a pretty good example yeah. of something that yeah. works in technology, like the USB committee and the Emoji committee, Unicode committee. And I think it's because you stack it with people that are vested experts in a field that are not politicians. <laughs> and I think that's why we have such better well, results with that. If you talk to the people who serve on those committees, they will say, oh, my God, they're broken. It's a fight. There's big companies come in. <laughs> But I sure. think you're right. I think that while there have been examples of standards not, be, you know, being influenced by the big companies, uh, I think in general it kind of does work. It certainly works a lot better than government. So maybe that yeah. is a model for the future. I don't know. Um, here's a little word of warning for people who uh, sell their Apple equipment. Brendan Mulligan, uh, who is an entrepreneur and a designer, uh, he says, I sold an old, old iMac to somebody and I had access to its location for over three years. Now, <laughs> uh, this doesn't happen if the new owner signs into their iCloud account, but apparently the new owner did not. And uh, <laughs> now he had erased the computer. He'd installed a fresh copy of OS X. Uh, he says, the mistake I made was I didn't sign out of iCloud and find my Mac before erasing. I thought erasing it would do it, but doesn't. So you have to remove. Oh, wow. You so have to if remove you it. Erased it. So yeah. are you sort of been in like purgatory if, if you don't no, sign out? No, it with. just means that that Mac will show up. And the worst thing is, maybe this is, maybe we're telling people something they shouldn't know, but you could, uh, 
And he said, points this out, with two clicks at any point, I could have shut down the user's computer, wiped it clean. They couldn't stop it. They'd have no control. So there's a message to both sides. If you're selling a Mac, log out. Not, not, don't merely erase it. Remove it from your Find My iPhone, from your iCloud account, you, which you can do before you erase it. And then if you buy a Mac or an iPhone for somebody, make sure you log it into your iCloud account so that the previous owner can't lock you out of your own stuff. Wow. So I guess my question is, if you erase everything on your computer, right, and yeah. you don't sign out of iCloud, is there no you way... You could go to another device, I think, and remove okay. it. I think. Yeah. This, this, yeah. The way that they've updated this multiple device sign-in... It's crazy, um, isn't it? It's crazy, and it's also challenging. Like, yes. if you don't, you know, and the, uh, I just had this problem with my iPad the other day. I was trying to sign on, and um, it's uh, it's really, it's it's really confusing, and I'm a pretty tech-savvy person. I can't imagine how, oh, it's nuts. you know, confounding yeah. it would be. Yeah. And what if you, have, what if you don't have it, another uh, Apple device? Or what if somebody stole your backpack, and they have all your devices? Yeah. Like, doesn't that, you know, like, isn't it meant right. to prevent theft? Good point. Of information. They have screens out there of what iOS was like, like for iOS 1, 2, and 3, and like compare it to all the setup screens today. And it's oh, yeah. like you go through so many modal dialogues these days. And I just, you know, like my measure of what I feel like normal people can get is like watching my husband. He just completely tunes it out. We bought him a new machine and just, he just doesn't want to deal with it. So it's, I feel like it's gotten so complicated. It's very easy for me to understand yeah. why someone would buy a Mac and would just hit do later, do later, do I had later. Yeah, great caller, a guy who was in his 80s called the radio show today. He says, "I'm a, I'm a technical writer. I've been writing about tech technology for 40 years. I uh, I have a Windows computer. I've been using Windows for 30 years. I have a Surface Pro right here. Somebody gave me an iPad. I can't figure out how the hell to use it. What do those pictures mean?" <laughs> What am I? And, and I said, "Oh, easy. Give it to a two-year-old. They'll show. They'll show you. They intuitively know how to use it. The problem is we have to unlearn everything we ever knew." He said, "Is there a manual for this thing?" And actually, I found out. Thank you to the chat room. There is a manual. It doesn't come on the uh, iPad, but you can go go into iBooks and download Apple's hundred, set three hundred page manual on how to use a iPad huh. for old people. Because <laughs> kids, I swear, I've seen nonverbal kids. Launch Netflix and launch Phineas and Ferb completely <laughs> autonomously, right? Here's a here's a, a, a Apple repair center that is, apparently doesn't really know how to use Apple technology. They've accidentally uh, called nine one one about sixteen hundred times in four months, and no one knows why. This is Elk Grove, California. The Elk Grove Police Department said, yeah, we get about 20 calls a day from the Apple Repair Center. There's nobody on the other line. <laughs> it, they're, apparently, they're coming from iPhones and Apple Watches. I don't know if you know, but there's an oh. emergency call feature now. If you press both buttons and hold it for a few seconds, it'll call 911. Uh, Apple said, we take this very seriously, and we're working closely with local law enforcement to investigate the cause and ensure this doesn't continue. Uh, I guess it's a little, I don't know. There's something they're doing in the recycling center. Maybe it's the way that they're trying to take the case, like yeah. pop the case off. It's yeah. got to be yeah. right. It's, yeah. But it's an Apple facility. That's the funny thing. Hmm. Wait, they're dealing with like broken iPhones and it's like the digitizer is all randomly yeah, pressing maybe that's and what it's it like is. dragging yeah. it across the screen. Yeah. I mean, I think really they should probably have a uh, Faraday cage around the building or something. <laughs> <laughs> they need to... <laughs> They need to. They need to do something. Thirty. So it, apparently, this is not unusual. Um, it's a problem, of course, for Elk Grove because their their lines are constantly being peppered by fake nine one one calls. But I get. I didn't know this, but in twenty eleven, a, a Google research study looked at nine one one calls in San Francisco and found this is seven years ago that thirty percent of the nine one one calls were accidental from wireless phones. Ooh. Uh, oh. and th but 37% from wired phones were accidental. <laughs> that was the part that I thought, well, who's accidentally calling 911 <laughs> yeah, from your landline? The same two-year-old. Yeah. He's trying to launch Phineas and Ferb <laughs> on the landline. <laughs> Come on, I know this, Wick. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> when Now, what's weird is uh, they can't just hang up if nobody's on the line because it could be somebody who's, you know, tied up and 
So when the dispatcher receives those calls, they 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 listen for a while. When they only hear an open line, they have to call back and leave a voicemail. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's not an easy problem to solve. All right, that was our happy segment. <laughs> Emojis, nine one one calls. Um, I don't want to go into the case against Google, but do you have an opinion on the, on that story? Um, Anybody have a th have a thought on this? This uh, we we talked about it a lot on on our show on Wednesday this week in Google. Critics say the search I, giant is squelching competition before it begins. They use as an example a vertical search uh, shopping engine called uh, uh, f uh, what was it? Uh, Found me something like that. Oh, I'll get the name right. Uh, and this couple, uh, Adam and Siobhan Raff, who have basically were put out of business by Google. They created a vertical uh, search shopping search. And uh, when they went live with it, they disappeared from the Google search page because Google, uh, in their algorithm, said, well, that you're just generating a link farm, basically. You're generating links to shopping sites, and we don't think that's what users want. And essentially, they, 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 had, they went out of business. Well, They've been well, suing. This is, this is the problem. Google is a commercial entity. Right. It's not the de facto, you know, it's not an, ar they're not archivists, right? So yeah. they don't have any obligation to show every single, you know, page and, and index it so that it can be listed publicly. No, they're a private enterprise. They, now, I guess if you're, uh, you know, you could go ag after them as the EU has for favoring their own shopping against a competitor. But Google, Google's explanation actually is kind of credible, which is, well, we don't surface sites that uh, don't have any uh, outbound link or inbound links. They just have a lot of uh, outbound links because we consider them uh, spam. Of course, as they point out in this article, that's all Google is. <laughs> it's a bunch of, <laughs> there's no, nobody links to a Google search result. It's all outbound links. Mm -hmm. Do you know uh, what gives me a lot of pause I, is I think if you look at the anti- um, you know, the, the legislation against Microsoft in the 90s, you know, basically ruling them a monopoly. And I think now, many years later, if you look at that, I think it's a very mixed bag if that particular legislation did anything Well, you should positive. read this article because, yeah. again, they talk about this. And, one, and they say Google wouldn't exist if Microsoft hadn't been slapped on the wrist by the DOJ, a process that took 10 years. Yeah. Cost a lot of money. Uh, a lot of people said it w w went so slow that by the time... The DOJ won that case. It didn't matter anymore. Right. I guess it's like I when I look at Facebook, I see the vicious effect Facebook has had on media. And it's like I understand that argument. Like that is that is an anti-competition case. I would be very interested in looking at. For Google, I I I can see it. I just you know it's any of these when you're talking about getting government involved in 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 slicing up a business as important as Google, it gives me pause. That's not to say I don't think we should do it. I just think it's something you should think very, very deeply about. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what worries me here, so I think it's it's totally valid for Google to say that um, that this company was just sending links uh, outward and, and, and therefore, it, you know, it, it maybe it, it wasn't the best um, – the, the best website. But what's a little bit scary is that Google can, you know, by flipping a switch, Google can either create a multi-million dollar business. Yep. Like this company had solved a problem that people legitimately wanted solved and and it could have grown into a very successful business. But by turning the switch off, Google was able to eliminate a competitor. And so, it, you know, it, it does tie into, I think, um, the Microsoft, legis the legislation against Microsoft that you're talking about, because you know, you could have made the same case for for Internet Explorer. I think um, you know Microsoft had every right to put Internet Explorer on the machines that were running Windows, but luckily we we were all given better um, better choices. You know, we, we were given Netscape, we were given um, Firefox, we were given eventually Chrome, and, and and the reason that those things were able to take off is because uh, Microsoft got slapped in the wrist for this Internet Explorer thing, and. Uh, you know, what's interesting is I, I don't know if it was in this New York Times article or a separate story that I read this week, but I, I think a lot of the employees that were working at Microsoft around that time said that there was um, it, it did have a residual effect. You know, after they were slapped on the wrist by the government, um, executives were 
thinking twice before making yep. decisions about um, about some of their that was businesses. in this article. Yep. Yeah, because because they didn't want to go through that ordeal again because it was such a it painted the company in such a negative light and it was such a headache for uh, for the higher ups that um, that there was careful consideration um, around decisions that were made. Uh, after the fact. And so I think with, you know, you're seeing that right now with Facebook and the way that it um, handles news and also the way that it, um, the way that it interacts with Washington. I think right now there, you know, from what I've heard from people inside Facebook, like the number one thing that Facebook doesn't want is to be regulated. And so, um, so there's a lot of special consideration around things like uh, deciding whether to flag um, whether to flag fake news or deciding whether to hire more curators to um, to, to, to curb fake news you know that there's really really careful consideration and long debates about any tiny little maneuver uh, that has to deal with either the news or uh, politics in in the US um, and and any of the um, sensitive content on Facebook right now because they're basically on high alert because uh, because you know the, the one thing that they don't want is 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 exactly what Microsoft went through in the 90s so that's beneficial mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, article says that the United States courts have increasingly held that the government has to show consumer harm to win in a case like this and that's part of the problem is consumers uh, are not complaining it, the people who are complaining against Google are other companies that's why it's succeeded in the European Union where competition is considered a more important net or a, a more important way to protect consumers is to preserve innovation and competition between companies it's a good article it's an interesting article it's a difficult uh, challenge it's clear though as Google and Facebook and Amazon get bigger and bigger um, the challenges are going to get bigger and bigger and this is another one of those difficult to legislate let's take a break and talk some more great panel here Amy Webb she's a futurist created uh, the Future Today Institute, publisher of the annual FTI Trend Report, just out. And her book, which is really worth working, will help you think about the future differently. The signals are talking why today's fringe is tomorrow's mainstream. Brianna Wu, she's running for Congress in the Massachusetts 8th District. Primary's coming up September. Brianna's working hard. She's raising money. You can go to BriannaWu2018.com to help out if you think we need more smart people like Brianna in Congress. I do. And, of course, from Mashable, Michael Nunez, who has not yet announced whether he's running. But he does, <laughs> <laughs> but he does believe in time. victory. Give it time. Yes. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by, speaking of legal matters, legal Zoom, small business, hot topic this year. You know, we talk a lot about the big businesses and the power, but, you know, this is National Small Business Month. Actually, uh, as a small business, I kind of appreciate legal Zoom. When I was starting out, and I, I, I consulted my friends who had started companies. They said, you need to make an LLC to protect yourself. And I went to LegalZoom, and they made it easy and affordable, even though I couldn't, you know, I was brand new. I couldn't afford a law firm. I got the advice and the information and the forms I needed from LegalZoom. Whether you're already in business or just starting out, 2018 is going to be an exciting year. The new tax law is perhaps the most significant change for business owners in the last 30 years. A lot of us looking at, well, should I incorporate? Should I be an LLC, a pass-through entity? LegalZoom can help you understand what it means for you. They're not a law firm. I want to make this clear, but they do hook you up with independent tax professionals and attorneys so you can get your questions answered about the new tax bill, about incorporation, about business matters. LegalZoom understands you need to type tap into the right resources to run a successful business. So they have been, they've been around for 16 years. They helped me a lot in the beginning, and they have taken what they know to provide business owners with the tools they need to start and run their businesses the right way. They have a white glove service for business owners. Everything you need to run your business. I still get the email from LegalZoom reminding me it's you know time to do this or that, which is fantastic. Um, I don't have to worry about compliance or when things are due. They let me know. The services include tax consult consultation, intellectual property, payroll, business compliance. They do it all. Over the next few weeks, because it's National Small Business Month, we're going to talk about different ways LegalZoom can help you this month. So if you want to, if you're in a small business or you want to start one, and who doesn't really want to have their own business, stay tuned. For now, check out LegalZoom.com today and get special savings when you enter the promo code TWIT in the referral box at checkout. LegalZoom, where life meets legal. LegalZoom.com. And if you, if you see something you want there, Make sure you use the offer code TWIT so they know you heard it here and you get a special $10 off 
LegalZoom.com. I'm always it, it, forever grateful to LegalZoom. We trademarked the Twit logo, uh, the Twit name. That was back in 2004, 2005. Uh, they had, they were, it was early on, and I'm very grateful to them for everything. I was just having to laugh at those prices. Like that's what one second of calling your lawyer. Oh, I know. On the phone call. I know. I know. Now we have, of course, we have a law firm, and I every right, time I get right. on the phone with lawyers, and there's three of them on the phone, <laughs> yep. I can't help it. I'm thinking that, that cost twelve dollars. That cost twelve dollars. Yep. Oh, it's <laughs> they're saying hello, and you're just like, let's move oh, past this. No, they talk. do. They Come they on, say, how was go. your day? And I know, no, oh, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and they bill in fifteen minute increments. Oh yeah, I don't I want do to talk about that. Yeah. Oh uh, no, but we have. I really love our. Our attorneys, they're really great. But, but it, I kind of wish I were back in the legal Zoom days, I, I got to say. Um, let's see. Let's talk about machine learning and ad buys. <laughs> Google has announced something called auto ads. They're not ads for automobiles, but they're ads that will use artificial intelligence, they say, to help you with placement and make choices for monetization. I feel like this is the beginning of what we're going to see big time. And it's Are people still paying attention to ads? Like I'd be curious. I just be I'm curious to find out if we've God, um, I hope so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, you're not talking about my ads, you're talking about banner ads, well, right? No, because, no, no, because <laughs> in the audio world, yeah, like, you have to listen. People just listen, right. right. I'm talking about the the um I don't see ads. banner ads. And I think there's this whole think, problem with uh, uh ad blockers and everybody's running ad blockers. Even Chrome now has ad blockers in it. Right. Ooh. Michael, I can yeah, I can say that like on Twitter and Facebook ads, they do work for a, for a congressional campaign at least. Like people do pay attention to yeah. those. I buy. I think you'd uh, find a lot of businesses that would say that they work oh, yeah, for they them work. as well, like yeah. Daniel Wellington, yeah. Allbirds, and you know there are multi million dollar companies that have been made in the past. I have so Allbirds. I on. have Allbirds. Yep, <laughs> they worked for me. <laughs> I yeah, actually I hate Instagram because they put an ad every what is it eighth post, and I have bought so much crap. <laughs> They're very effective. <laughs> uh, but I'm talking about Google, right? Because Google doesn't, uh, Google's not selling ads on Facebook. No, they're doing banner ads, right? No, no. Right. So yes, that's what I'm but... saying. Are people like Michael, do you have, I mean, you probably can't tell us very much, but like you, for Mashable. But... You have Google ads on Mashable, I'm sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't obviously. Um... You don't know because this is good because they, they separate that away from you as they should. That, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but I'm sure we do. I mean, I, I imagine but that we do. But do you get a sense that people like are like there's avoidance, you know, like um, I, I don't even I know that there are ads on my screen. I have ad blockers up, but I just I don't even they don't register anymore. You know, Ooh. I know. I, yeah, for me, that's very true, except in the case of like, you know, when, when they're inserted in the feeds that I'm looking at, it, they're they're very effective. I've, I've never really clicked on Google AdSense ads to, yeah. to the end, my so. suspicion is this is exactly why google's doing this because yeah. they want to make ads more effective they claim uh that they are seeing with this auto you know this artificial intelligence uh auto ads placement that they're seeing average revenue lift at 10 percent with revenue increases ranging from five to 15 percent i would guess that's exactly why because they're you know they're using things like heat maps where people look and they're really starting to get smart about ad placement. I guess it makes sense too. Like I think about how much time for us on a campaign, we do A versus B testing and different keyword testing to, you know, with like, and we do all kinds of, uh, you know, advertising like mailing lists or buying certain kinds of ads. And either as a candidate get in and get really deep with like, what is my message I'm trying to do here? Who am I trying to target? Or you have to hire someone that's very, very expensive to go like work that out for you and find that market segmentation. So um, like I read this and I'm like, I would absolutely use something like this if it was effective. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a certainly like removing the human element from that, which I like. So I'm actually curious, you, uh, you, uh, do you have consultants who help you with this? 
So to be honest, uh, when big Democratic Party consultants call me, I, I just I think it's a dark road to go down. You know, when I run into people, they're passionate about, say, cybersecurity and want to get involved with our campaign. We do hire people like that that have experience with marketing. But, you know, as far as like, you know, like that. There's now, a, if you win the primary, the DNC yep. is going to step up and say, OK. We'll take it from here, aren't they? I guess I've I've upset a lot of people at the DNC in running because uh -oh. uh, you know I've 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 critiqued our party quite a bit, like FISA. Uh, I'm very upset about that. Good. So we'll we'll see we'll see. They may no look if you win the primary. Yep. They got to go with you. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so do they though? Do they have to, or can they? No, they don't have to do anything. Right. 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 I mean, I imagine they would. It's Just like, ask. It's not like I'm. You know, a, ask Bernie I'm Sanders. Fine, fine. <laughs> see what see what happened with Bernie. Yeah, I think that's really fair. Yeah. Um, Brian Feinstein <laughs> today is uh, un unendorsed, right? Yep. Did that just happen yeah. hours ago? Yeah. Yep. So I was very happy. I'm just curious because there, of course, there was a big article in Wired this week about uh, saying, in effect, forget Russian bots. That wasn't Trump. The Trump campaign used Facebook very effectively. They won because they used it very effectively. It was actually a fascinating article. And one of the things uh, we knew also this. written by the guy who created their advertising platform. I think that's a oh, really, really? Piece of mm -hmm. that story. Yeah. Um, so he was the former head of advertising at Facebook. Uh, he wrote the what? book Chaos Monkeys on Antonio. Oh, he's a jerk. Uh, well, I mean, Chaos <laughs> Monkeys is the worst. Oh, it, it's. It's a fine, you know, it's a fine book, but but I think no, it's, it's not. <laughs> that he, uh, he built the platform that he's championing. Okay, so he's that okay. Wired. What? <laughs> this is not editorial. This is a this is an opinion piece. Does by it, the does way, it list it? an opinion. No, I think they call it editorial. And by the way, uh, somebody pointed out Casey Newton wrote essentially the same story in uh, last year about how uh, you know the Trump camp. Let me see if I can find it. The Trump campaign very. Intent, you know, cleverly. Uh, here it is. How face how Trump conquered Facebook without Russian ads. This is uh, this doesn't say opinion. Uh, hmm. I mean, it's you, you know, scroll, it's scroll to the bottom and see if it lists his. Sometimes they they'll put a disclaimer at the in the tagline at the bottom. Mm, I don't even see a bio at the bottom. Yeah. I don't even see mention of Chaos Monkeys, which made him persona non grata in Silicon Valley for some time. Oh, 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 look. Here. Okay, look at this page. Can you tell anything about this page? There's a little word here. Ideas. Ooh. That, oh, that, does that mean it's an opinion piece? I don't know. I, I know the people who, who work on the editorial side. I, they're, I don't think that, that this, this is surprising. Well, well, this is the new behind I, a paywall I, I, Wired, right? Yeah, and I have I have other issues with Wired this month, but but um, <laughs> but you know I'm not I'm not saying that um, that you know that this story isn't. I, I just think that that should be disclosed. I mean, if we're gonna, have it a, does an say now in the bio is an ideas contributed for Wire. Uh, then it talks. It does talk about chaos monkeys in the bio uh, on the left. So, uh, but I didn't. You know, now that I see it, I guess it's an opinion piece. But uh, it sure felt like a high, heavily researched piece uh, on how, and I think there's merit in this on how Facebook really does give some real tools uh, to political campaigns. Are, do you advertise on Facebook, uh, Brianna, for your campaign? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the same tools that uh, Trump used for his election, Nation Builder, we use that as well. It's it's a really it's amazing really good. thing. Like, it's really good. Like, you type it in, you get all kinds of data about who's following you and what their interests are. Uh, I forget the number. I think it's some ridiculously high number of software engineers have contributed to my campaign. So, you know, uh, but yeah, like, you know, there's all that data out there. So you got to use it. We think of um, so we we think of right now um, the Republicans being further behind, and you know, with Obama was the sort of advent of uh, amazing technology and grassroots and social media and all this. Um, the Republicans in the early 2000s were light years ahead of the Democrats, and for a mm -hmm. hot minute, I don't know if you guys ever saw this. It was Bush and Cheney when they, when they were running for about five seconds. That was more than five seconds for 
a couple of hours, they had this poster generator on their website, their campaign site, where you could type in. They learned you quickly, know, like, didn't they? <laughs> they did. Like, whatever you, you know, like. You don't let the mom. internet do that, no. Yes, for Bush Cheney 2004. Oh and my gosh. Uh, and anything, any poster that got created, it was intended for you to print out, but, but they created a gallery. And so they were all being funneled into this gallery. And it took like less than an hour for you know, neighborhood moms for Bush Cheney 2000, you know, for to turn into like the most ridiculous, crazy. Yeah. And the whole thing got taken down. Um, <laughs> but wow. anyhow, but I it, did but, not know about this. And actually, I was looking Metafilter had a link to all of them, but they're all 404s now. They've deleted <laughs> all of them. And that here's an pretty, article I mean, from it, Wired. Bush site unplugs poster tool. That was it. <laughs> yep. Oh, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But they were pretty. You know, we don't. We don't now in the era of Trump don't think about this. But the Republicans were really far ahead in a lot of the technology in the early days, like really far ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Doing some really innovative things. Well, all right. So treat this Wired article really uh, as an inside look at how it works. Let me find it again. I've. I put here it is from the guy who was the product manager for custom audiences. Uh, I didn't, I, I should have read this more carefully. Thank you, Michael, for pointing this out. Um, and he created this custom audiences is the tool. One of the tools you said, nation builder, Brianna, that must be another yep. one yep. Uh, that allows, basically allows a advertiser to under to buy specific groups, right? Yes, and target target specific uh, groups. I think that's correct. There's also yeah. a tool that lets you take. I know because uh, Jason Calacanis told me about this. Take your mailing list and find like-minded people. Feed it to Facebook, and the Facebook algorithm says, "Well, here's people who are on on the or not on the mailing list, but are like-minded. Yep. You should be talking to." It's called look-alike yep. audiences. Yep, we've got that. You got that too. <laughs> Yeah, we do. It's expensive. It costs a lot of money, too. When you've built a custom audience, can you build lookalike audiences? The most unknown and poorly understood yet powerful weapon in the Facebook ads arsenal. With a mere mouse click from our hypothetical campaign manager, Facebook now searches the friends of everyone in the custom audience, trying to find everyone who looks like you, using a witch's brew of mutual engagement. And by the way... Every day, this tool becomes better, right? Because Facebook gets more data all the time, and it's and it's just self reinforcing better and better and better. Um, it's it's is Facebook going to dominate every campaign from now on? In well, I mean, think about it like this, Leo. I, I was thinking about this the other day. Like, I was going to go drive to talk to a group of uh, disabled people here in Massachusetts. This is very important. Like, these are my constituents. I've got to meet them and listen to them. But, you know, it's like three hours to drive there and back and come to another event. It's like if I'd spent that time on, like, that same Facebook group, disabled people, like, you get much plugged in effective. so much. Yeah. It is. And it's, you know, it's... I think when you know somebody on Facebook and you're talking to them, I think that's a genuine connection where you're, you see what's important to them every day. So honestly, I think in this sense, it's more of a net positive than it is a net negative. You know, when people can genuinely talk to you, I think that's, that's better than, you know, trying to go to a campaign with 500 other people and shake their hand for four seconds. I agree. We are very yeah. fortunate that we have a chat room that is a very adept at this thing called the internet. Thank you, Bleak, has provided me with some of the... Uh... Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, so, so chat room oh, that's folks, a good one. I'm sure somewhere <laughs> there is, uh, there have got to be screen grabs of some of the awesome. other posters. Uh, I mean, you, yeah. you probably can't show. Uh, we probably they can't were. show all of them. That one said <laughs> Bush so. Cheney uh, 2004 stealing elections since, I don't know. Oh, this one's... They were amazing this one's they dead were. uh yeah you don't let people write their own slogans for your campaign <laughs> uh, here's, no, a, just, here's a good one I, war is peace hate is love bush cheney 04 yeah of course from uh, coming from the 1984 truth speak wow. but from a technical vantage point just on the back end it was a pretty like obviously the implementation get, didn't get thought through yeah. but the technology was sure. actually pretty good for back then yeah that's clever yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, love it. There were some really funny ones. There was a whole um, series uh, with uh, Jefferson Airplane. Is that a band? Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> featuring like Jefferson Airplane lyrics for some reason. <laughs> One side makes you taller. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. Uh, this is uh, so much fun, and I'm so glad we have the smartest people on the Internet with us today to protect me from whatever I might buy next on Facebook. Michael Nunez for Mashable. Thank you for staying late in the office tonight. Anything more coming in from the... Actually, I want to ask you what other... We talked all about the Samsung. I want to ask you in a bit what other phones are, are new at uh, Mobile World Congress. What other things? Oh, are for? there's some recommendations we good, can make. Yeah, good. Uh, Brianna Wu, Brianna Wu 2018.com. Donate. And uh, Amy Webb, <laughs> she'll take that money, buy great Facebook ads, and you'll see a lot more of her in your feed. Uh, the signals are talking why today's fringe is tomorrow's mainstream. We had a fun week on Twit. We've even made a highlight reel for your delectation watch. Previously on Twit. Do we switch back now? Yeah. Is it I time? I guess we do. Is it time? Of course, we'll have to wipe things, up, wipe things. you know, the data what? and stuff. And my germs, probably, too. Probably, but <laughs> that's okay. They because swapped I iPhone and Pixel. Google Pixel. For, iOS for today. Jason. Can I give you a tip on Venmo that I, I think? Change your privacy settings. Because by default, all of your transactions are revealed. Oh this my week God. In Google. Google AI can predict heart attacks just by looking at your eyes. See, the, technology's uh, not so bad. Uh, See? Uh, until your insurance company starts taking pictures of you on the street and denies you uh, saying, uh -huh. sorry, Jeff, you can't get a uh, insurance because we could see from your eyes you're going to get sick. That is very panoptic, Leo. <laughs> I, you know, hey, I'm like all about the panopticon, man. A bad path on this show. Twit Live Specials. <laughs> get looks, S9 and S9 Plus. Okay, it's thin, it's sexy, it's got the curves. You know, we got some some nice metallic blue. And there are the ports. There are the ports, there, ladies there the and ports. gentlemen. Oh, look at that. It's what the, is look at the dandelions. Well, yeah, wait. This is AR. Oh, they probably have AR. They're holding their phones up. Right. That's probably AR. Yeah. Twit. For help with the technology addiction problem, call 1 800 TWIT. <laughs> I wish and that's not plus. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. That so Thank okay, you. DJ. That's it. It ended quickly. <laughs> uh, show today brought to you by ZipRecruiter. If you're doing some hiring, ZipRecruiter is going to be the easiest way to fill that job with exactly the right person. The right person's out there, but how do you reach them? With all those job boards, all the different places you can go, well, that's the beauty of ZipRecruiter. One post on ZipRecruiter posts to 100-plus job sites with one click. And even better... ZipRecruiter has created a smarter way to find the right people. They built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. ZipRecruiter, it learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and literally invites them to apply to your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. Technology, you got to use it. It's out there, and it can really change what you do. Turns out 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter, 80%, Get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. It really works. We've used it. It's amazing. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even go through the resumes, the applications, and spotlight the strongest applications so you don't have to miss a great match because you're overwhelmed. The right candidates are out there. They're waiting for you. ZipRecruiter will help you find them. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs from the Fortune 100 to little old twit. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter. Look at the fields. Look at all the categories. Look at all the companies. Facebook uses ZipRecruiter. That actually is really a good endorsement. Facebook uses ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. It's the smartest way to hire, and it's easy and free right now. It's ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Michael Nunez Mashable is manning the uh, the MWC desk in New York City. You're the That's only right, one yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but all the reports yeah. are coming into you, right? <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, they've slowed down at this point. I think everyone in Barcelona is probably sleeping right now. They're, but, um, they're drunk on hand. But yeah, it's been, a, it's been a busy day. Um, a lot of big Android announcements. Um, I feel like a lot of the news is bigger in Europe and other parts of the world, but it's still really interesting to follow if you're – if you're at all interested in mobile technology, I mean, it's it's all happening this weekend. It's funny because uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft, 
uh, Facebook, they all have their own events. They all make their announcements at those events. They don't, they don't piggyback off of other events. But for some reason, the rest of the companies, including Samsung, they, yep. they like to be at Mobile World Congress. Why is that? Yeah, I think it's just because there are so many brands in and companies in one place at one time. And it's also just, I think, like you said, you know, a piggyback is a good word. You can, uh, in the case of Samsung, they're able to piggyback off of some of the excitement and, uh, and some of the, the, I don't know, just the buzz surrounding that event. Um, they've definitely tried to do their own thing in the past. Um, you know, there was one year where they rented uh, Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Oh, God, that was the worst. Their, their Galaxy phone at, at their own event. Um, and so they've tried to do... That was um, the one where they had a fake Broadway play. And at yeah. one point, they were talking about how you could hover your fingers over the phone. You didn't have to touch it. And they had, and it was I'm sad to say, a woman said, when my nail polish is wet, I can use my Samsung phone. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, cringy. Oh, tone deaf, to say the least. Really <laughs> cringy. Um, yeah, so I think like following that. They've you know, learned from that. Generally regarded as, as kind of a failure, um, yeah. even though, um, you know, it was just, it was Samsung trying to do what Apple does really well, which is host its own event and create a lot of buzz around that. Um, when Samsung tried, it was, you know, it was off the mark. It was, you know, there were moments during that presentation that were just tone deaf. And so I think they've reverted back to what they, what they had been doing, which was, um, which was sort of using, um, other industry events to, to, to make these big announcements. So in this case, um, I don't even think the galaxy S nine event was associated directly with mobile world Congress. I don't think it was an official event at the show. Um, it just happened to be, this Sunday or today, I guess, um, which sort of predate, which which precedes the actual. It, it just happened to be in Barcelona. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yeah. it's it's the weekend right before the conference kicks right. off. So, right. um, right. I, you know, I I don't know if that. But there were other actually, announcements. You said there were other phones there. There were, yeah. You know, one one of the more interesting things for me, at least, because I'm just kind of weird, uh, is is the Nokia. Um, some of the 80, announcements. The eighty one ten. I'm oh, so the banana, the banana phone. Yes. Matrix yeah, coming back. Call, I can't I wait. I call it the Matrix phone because I'm obsessed with it the Matrix. Totally have the Matrix phone. Wait a minute. This is the phone that's in the, was in the Matrix? Yeah. 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 Well, it's the the banana phone. I don't know why. It's but, banana yeah. yellow. That's why. Well, uh, yeah. this is uh, Jake K from The Verge showing it off. Oh, so it's, a, it slides down. It's a, it's a oh, feature phone. phone. It's not a smartphone. Or is it a smartphone? It's a feature. It time. has 4G in it. Okay. But it doesn't have a operating system <laughs> per se. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the screen is tiny and there's no um, QWERTY. But, but, but Keanu Reeves will come to wherever you are if you call. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why yeah, I'm so buying myself one. <laughs> I, I want that. I remember watching The Matrix and trying to figure out how to get one. Like, because. <laughs> yeah in Mississippi when that came out and I did the math on it was going to cost like $3,000 and I couldn't get it and now I can get it so I'm very and you better get it in banana yellow or you'll really be oh uh, okay okay I can do that is that what Neo would do? <laughs> um, yeah, Neo would do it Neo would do it <laughs> it's you know, this is a phone that I've wanted for more than a decade, I guess. So yep. uh, it was really excited. It doesn't have the same it. action, though, right? You can't, like, click it and have it wow, go down. Wow, a true fan. So you're right. You're exactly right. I mean, I noticed yeah. that I wasn't going to point that out because I, I wasn't sure how people would respond to that. But um, in the movie, there's we an uh, actuated how. mechanism. To, that, so when you push a button, yeah. the bottom shoots out right. Um, right. because it's spring-loaded, whereas this new one... It appears to just slide off, which is a little oh. less. Uh, <laughs> it's so, uh, it's so, it's so much. Uh, why would they miss <laughs> that critical feature? Yeah, I, I mean, think the better thing to say is, wait a minute, Nokia just made another phone. Nokia's yeah, they're making phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I know. Yeah, I still I get excited <laughs> when. Um, Here's I Neo when on his so banana phone. Face. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's Mr. Smith. And uh, oh, God, that's, I love that movie. The Matrix was, I have never felt. Oh, I, he's flipping Mr. Smith off. That's mean. That's rude. Do you remember? <laughs> I, don't think that's, that I don't think that's the phone. Ring, 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 I don't ring, think. Ring, I have once, once again been deceived by YouTube. <sighs> I wanted to find the actual video. Here, I think this is. 
I hope this is it. This is. Uh, I'm gonna say banana is phone the rest of the day. Banana is I phone. Know. I like that. <laughs> Um, so I think this is smart. Nokia announced the 3310 uh, last year or the year before, which was also one of those candy bar phones. And uh, yeah, I, how did that sell? Do you know? Is it was it? I don't think well. Um, I, I don't know any any actual numbers, but my impression is that it it didn't it didn't do spectacularly. But it's just kind of interesting to know that there's still a demand for these. Uh, I guess you can call them dumb phones. And I, I don't know if Ooh. it's the nostalgia factor Ooh. or what, but there it is. There Ooh. it is. Oh, look at that come out. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let's see that again. That and was hot. I need my I need the Samsung super slow motion for that. <laughs> He's opening up the FedEx package. Yes, they do have it's FedEx in the Matrix. <gasps> there we go. Oh, oh, baby. I wanted that phone so oh. bad. Like, really? Oh, I thought it's funny. I, I love that movie, that. but I didn't I didn't get fetishized about the phone. Oh, I did. Oh, goodness. Yes. I've been looking for you, Neo. I've been I don't looking know for you, Neo, on your <laughs> banana phone. But unfortunately, you and I have... You know, what I was thinking about recently was, like, I, I heard that they're going to remake The Matrix. Uh, they're going to reboot The Matrix pretty soon. And I wonder what The Matrix would be like in the era of smartphones. You know, does the premise still hold true? Can you, can you create these situations where... They're running to a landline and that sort of thing. Um, so, I don't know. anyways, I'll just throw that out there I think for, once, for anyone else. That, once they met the uh, the architect, the whole series, uh, the whole thing fell it's apart. Just, yeah, it's just completely, thing. it's completely wow. over now. I don't see I just, the whole premise of the Matrix. I was the Matrix is set at the height of our civilization, which right. is clearly the '90s, right? It's not going to be today. So, you know, Spice Girls, they, MTV, there's a lot that have gone you know? downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a little yeah. clip, just for those of you who don't remember, of uh, Neo in the Matrix. Let me turn on the. Uh, uh, oh, I star. love this. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait no, a minute. That's going to be better. Is, is that that's Will Ferrell as. Sean and Justin, because you, my friend, are completely whipped. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the sass, Captain Sassy Pants. Yeah, you're kind of spazzing out, dude. You haven't answered my question. Yes, I did. You see, what you haven't answered my I'm trying. You just need to let me talk. Why am I here? Oh, you <laughs> shut up. You won't let it. No, you won't let it. I'm the one who talks. <laughs> okay, mouth shut. Ears open. You you want... All right, enough. I'm sorry. Once again, oh. I have been fooled by YouTube. That was so much better than the original. It was. That was the MTV yeah, really Awards. Was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Will Ferrell and Justin Timberlake. Mocking the greatest movie ever made, <laughs> The Matrix Three. That that first, the first Matrix was brilliant. <clears throat> up until the end, when Love Saved the Day was like the greatest thing yep. I've I've ever seen. I agree. And the fact yep. that, that somebody thinks it's a good idea to remake that in the year terrible. Oh, well, no, terrible. Is there, are they remaking it or continuing it? Uh, I think they're going to reboot it. What? Yeah. yeah. That shows they've run out of you know, ideas. Honestly, I'm actually excited for the reboot. So I'm not even going to lie. Oh, I'll probably go I probably see it. I liked all three. Yeah. Uh, I you did? It. Oh, well, there's something wrong with you then. I don't I know. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm rare. I'm one of the rare true fans of The Matrix. Uh, oh. So, yeah, I'm, oh, wait, here. I'm here for all of it. Did you see the... Did you see the when did you see The Matrix? Were you, did you see it in a movie theater or did you see it like later on in the... Later on, no, I saw it in a, I saw it on a plane for the very first oh, time, and I oh. just became obsessed and and yeah. bought the DVD. And, I I think and, probably like you, Amy, I didn't know what I was going to. I went yeah. to a matinee. I had not read anything. I know I didn't. I had no idea, and I walked out of that theater with my draw yeah. on the ground, absolutely, trying to figure out if I was I in the matrix. So yeah. Right, and that's well, why my, I ha and I saw it. I was in I was living in Japan at the time, and I had just gotten out of a three hour Aikido practice, and so like the kung fu scenes, you know, I was oh, all sweaty. Bullet and stuff. time. So, oh, yeah. oh yeah, and that's why I had this like I had never felt that way. I yeah. felt ah, oh, I was just absolutely blown away, and that's why the two matrixes that came afterwards were yes. so like unbelievably, yep. Disappointing and depressing because yep. I expected so much more. Yep. 
I do have to say the PlayStation 2 game, uh, they actually went and filmed all these uh, like scenes. It works in conjunction with the second Matrix movie. Yeah. And you've got like all these awesome scenes with Ghost and Jada Pinkett Smith's character. It's like the game itself, the gameplay is very mediocre, but it's it's a really good story. I thought that was very successful. If you're a real fan, Michael, like you will actually <laughs> like play well, all the way and through I also, that game. If just to defend the second one briefly, yeah. I really liked the um, metaphor that were used across the movie so like you know back doors were were um were were physical parts of of the matrix and uh and what else like you know the ghosts i think were viruses and there were there was a lot of um a lot of computer jargon that was used in like really creative ways in, in a way i think i mean given remember we'd seen sneakers and hackers and all these terrible <laughs> movies about technology in a way this was the first movie where it, it, at least Plot looked plausible, the technology, and it felt like, yeah, they're getting it right. Yep. All right. And yeah. then I thought it was just the story fell apart. But but that, I don't know. I This rebooting, like, amazing mm. movies always makes me really nervous. I know. I know. And this, this is one well for Total Recall. <laughs> oh, did, Arnold is the only Total Recall. I'm sorry. Yep. There's oh, no that reason. That movie is bad. It's Ooh. a terrible movie. That's what makes <laughs> it so good. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch it now, you realize, my God, did we have no taste back then? What <laughs> that thing is the worst. But oh, it's I fun. Meant the reboot. I meant the reboot. The reboot, the reboot is unwatchable. Like too slick. Oh. Yeah, I agree. Oh. I mean, but but I have to say, it's the same thing with Terminator. The special effects in those days were not, <laughs> you know, even believable. They weren't like Sharknado level good. Not even Sharknado <laughs> level good. <laughs> oh. Listen, no matter what evil is going on in the world, nothing's as human bad. thought, like, like, like somebody green lighted Sharknado. Yeah. And that gives us hope for the future. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is, is Twitter lockout not a thing anymore? Is that like, do we, is that the fastest meme that ever ended? Uh, wow. This was, of course, Twitter earlier this week decided to delete a number of bots. Yeah. We don't know. I don't know if we ever got the details on how many. But conservatives decided that it, they were being targeted because it turned out, oddly, a lot of those bots followed conservative users. And so mm -hmm. this is an example of how there is a, a divergence in the, the reality uh, of uh, the people live in. Uh, conservatives sh thought this was proof positive, proof positive that Twitter was out to block them and hurt them. Hmm. Uh, and, and others said, well, of course, you're the first people who are going to lose followers. Now, some people actually uh, were real people <laughs> who were locked out, and they were asked to uh, verify their phone number, but that's not a big deal. No. Uh, we don't know how Twitter, uh, t uh, you know, what its criteria were. We don't know how many it deleted. This is a real guy, apparently, who, or may, who knows? For all I know, he's actually a Russian-controlled account that decided to make a big deal out of it actually that's the part of the problem with this is you don't now you know no longer trust anybody you don't know what that it's like we're in the matrix five thousand of my blocked accounts like went away so my number went from like fifteen thousand oh. blocked down to like ten thousand oh that's so. interesting yep i should i did i only lost a few hundred followers but i should look at how many of the people i've blocked went away yep <gasps> You went that you lost five thousand accounts that you had blocked. Those were yep. presumably Russian bots. Well, the most of the accounts I blocked were during Gamergate, but yeah, oh, I mean, just, oh, they were Gamergate. It so, I do you it think it, during Gamergate, where you were one of the chief targets and you had to move and everything, it was terrible. Yeah. Do yeah. you think that a lot of that was Internet Research Agency now in hindsight? I mean, I don't think it was bots. I do think that they specialized in a, a Twitter. They they used bots to attack me, but I don't think it was like a, a Russian propaganda thing. I think people found out they could buy bots to have certain uh, behavior. And, you know, we actually worked with Twitter quite a bit in, uh, gosh, it was 2016 and 2017 to work on that. And they were very effective in finally solving that. Interesting. Very interesting. So you think that uh, these were just accounts for sale that were used by, was it mostly, you think, American trolls that were going after Yeah, you? that's yeah. my belief with yeah. it. Okay. We've learned so much uh, since the indictment about uh, these, this internet research agency, which had a significant budget and was using real accounts, fake accounts, sock puppet, puppet accounts to influence. Uh, 
I, you know, I don't want to even say American election influence America thought influence yeah. you to create to disturb America. I wouldn't be surprised if Gamergate was part of that campaign, but it was before really this all became an issue, right? Yeah, I mean, their well, goal is it's to divide people us. It's not, it. yeah. Right to divide us. Right. It's not ideological. It no. doesn't have anything with right versus left. Like right. they support people on the right and the That's left. Right. So That's right. there it is. Uh, Intel um, getting a little bit of heat. Uh, they uh, apparently uh, knew about the chip flaws in the, the Spectre and Meltdown chip flaws <laughs> months before they told the U.S. cyber officials and CERT. In Ooh. fact, they told Chinese companies, Lenovo and others, before they told the U.S. government. This was kind of a known issue on their end, though, for like... 20 years, right? Or for, for like a very, very long time. Well, that's also part of the story, isn't it? That uh, speculative execution, which is a technique that uh, Intel, AMD, and ARM all use to speed up processor performance, had a potential problem, a leakage of information. And yes, there was a paper written in 1994 saying exactly that, that yeah, you've got to watch out because there's, there's a, there's, this could be, there's, you know, I don't know if they mentioned timing attacks, but that these could be problematic. So Intel probably did have some idea, but I don't know if they knew how serious it was. And it really, uh, Spectre and Meltdown uh, were discovered kind of simultaneously by a number of security teams because timing attacks ha had become uh, something we were all aware of, and they were really looking at timing attacks. There were other, there was Rowhammer and other timing attacks that had been discovered. And I think the security community then said, yeah, we should see what else we can do with these. Hmm. And that's when speculative execution, you know, really... Has speculative execution been in the Intel chips for that long? 1995. Split, it's really been in there that long? Yeah. The Ring 1 and Ring 0 executions of it? Yeah. All of that? Yeah. Hmm. Pred predictive branching and speculative execution uh, because Intel was running, it was hitting a wall. Huh. And uh, these were ways to speed up chips. And it worked so well, by the way, everybody adopted it. Hmm. Current and former U.S. government officials have raised concerns that the government was not informed about these flaws before they became public. In fact, <laughs> we had on uh, uh, the screensavers yesterday uh, Ian Thompson from The Register. The Register revealed this, and it wasn't until The Register published this article that Intel, and by the way, Intel's first reaction was, yes, yeah, 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 <laughs> that Intel <laughs> felt, oh, now we got to tell everybody. Um, so this is, uh, it was Google's Project Zero that informed Intel, AMD, and uh, ARM holdings of the problem back in June. As with most security revelations, they gave the chip makers 90 days before public disclosure. Um, Wait, who's the they? Alphabet was uh, uh, the Google security team that oh, discovered I see, I see. Yeah, 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 Project yeah. Zero. Yeah. Um, the fabulous Tavis Ormandy and his, his team over there. Cool. Anyway. I don't know. So I was just talking to my husband who um, is also a geek and all of his friends uh, work at Amazon. And anyhow, uh, it's really interesting. The Apparently, Amazon Web Services, um, to deal with the problem, it, the, the centers are configured so well that it was a downtime, minimal downtime. It, it wasn't that you know, huge of a deal. Um, and for people running on Microsoft servers, Azure it was some significant. Yeah. apparently yeah, much more difficult. But it, it says something about um, the organizational structure of the, the backbone companies that we all rely yes. on that are sort of yeah. invisible, you know. And incidentally, uh, that's the, those are the people who really have to worry about Spectre and Meltdown because right. there are multiple people using the same processor. So if one of them is a bad guy... Um, right, and the virtual machines apparently were part of a problem too, because if the uh, if you had an apparently it could leap, you know, you the, the 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 problem could propagate, and so many machines are now virtualized that that that's like that's like another weird problem that nobody probably thought of. Right, this would be a good ago. time for me to mention our uh, sponsor, and then we'll get some <laughs> final thoughts, including a word from Kylie Jenner. But first, <laughs> first, let's talk about Google's cloud platform and something they called. Cloud Spanner. As often is the case, uh, Google tries these technologies, uses them internally. Cloud Spanner is the first horizontally scalable, strongly consistent relational database service tested by fire in Google's own usage and now available to you on the cloud platform. You know, it's it's kind of common, common wisdom that uh, distributed databases can't be both relational and scalable. 
But what if you didn't have to make trade-offs? What if there were a no-compromise solution, a fully managed database service that's consistent, that scales horizontally across data centers? It speaks SQL, so you don't have to learn a new language. Introducing Cloud Spanner, it's a mission-critical relational database service from Google Cloud Platform, built from the ground up and battle-tested at Google for strong consistency and high availability at global scale. Cloud Spanner delivers scalability, high transaction performance, and strong consistency across rows, regions, even continents, with an industry-leading, get this, SLA, 99.999%. That's five nines. No plan downtime, enterprise-grade security, multi-language support. You could choose from C Sharp, Go, Java, Node.js, PHP, Python, and Ruby. For the client libraries, they've got a JBD, JDBC driver for connectivity with all the popular third-party tools. And it's very affordable. Pricing is very simple. And no surprises. Very predictable. You can even try it free. So find out more about Cloud Spanner. I'm going to give you a, a, a short URL. Makes it easier for you to type it in. G.co slash get spanner. That's G.co. Google's uh, URL shortener. G.co slash get spanner. Find out more about the mission-critical relational database service from Google Cloud Platform. Battle-hardened in the Google <laughs> servers. G.co slash get spanner. We thank you. I'm really thrilled to have Google Cloud Platform as a sponsor on our shows. It tells me that Google knows there's a lot of geeks a listening. <laughs> a lot of geeks a listening. Not as many as listen to Kylie Jenner. <laughs> Kylie Jenner... I don't know anything about the Kardashians. <laughs> That's <laughs> probably the best. So, yeah. <laughs> Wise. Yeah. Wise. But I gather that she is a, a third-generation Kardashian. Uh, and she is apparently very popular with the young'uns. Is that true? I, I, yes, I think I can confirm that. Yeah. <laughs> She's very As the youngest person on this show, Michael, I think you're going you're gonna to tell us everything. So on Thursday... <laughs> Kylie Jenner tweets, so does anyone else not open Snapchat anymore? I don't even know if she talks like that, but I'm going to pretend she does. <laughs> or is it just me? Ugh, so sad. Actually, shortly after she realized, oh, maybe I, yeah, that might have, have, did I go too far? So she immediately says, still love you though, Snap, my first love. Snapchat immediately loses $1.3 billion in value on the stock. <laughs> $1.3 <laughs> million dollars. Oh. Now, to be fair, it also happened that an analyst that day downgraded the stock um, and that I, a lot of this is coming from Snapchat fans who are saying we don't like the new Snapchat, but... It's it's worth adding, like, they have no business plan. The people running Snapchat have completely blown their IPO. I mean, this is not the best, like, social media company in the world. So, yeah, I think I feel like Kylie Jenner is just one more like problem <laughs> the, the nail in the coffin problems. maybe <laughs> yes yes uh, but we should point out that their uh, ceo and, and founder evan spiegel is perhaps one of the highest paid executives in the u.s after the ipo he collected a 636 million dollar stock grant wow it does it won't vest fully for two more years so it's not <laughs> you know don't go hit him up for a billion now <laughs> But uh, you, later. Could look, you could look at this story in a more optimistic framing, right? So content still obviously matters a lot. Good point. So that's a good thing, right? I mean, she's content for what it's worth. She is, she is content. She's photos and inane, nonsensical videos. But, <laughs> you know, they drive traffic and people seem to care. And if the content th is threatened to go away, then you know, market value is lost. I actually think that's a good thing for, for content creators. It reminds them it of is. their value. It's not the platform. It's us. Wow. Yeah. That's a v you excellent See, take. I can go positive. positive. That's what really good, Amy. Thought. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> what I don't I like is that the FCC order became official yesterday, Friday, the uh, Restoring Internet oh. Freedom Order, which in fact, of course... Kills net neutrality entered the federal federal registry. Now the, the the key here is that now all the lawsuits can begin. Wow. Now that it's the uh, the regulation of the land, so to speak, uh, all of the uh, and there are many states attorneys general. There are many uh, entities 
EFF and others who are going to be suing. So this this begins. But meanwhile, uh, net neutrality is dead, uh, at least until uh, <sighs> some court comes along and, and, and protects it, which I don't think is going to happen. Uh, I was really trying to get through a show without dropping the F bomb. <laughs> I have nothing positive to say about this FCC chairman or I know, any so part depressing. of this process. Ironically, uh, yeah. I thought for a while. Well, we still don't have to worry because the big ISPs—they're not going to, you know, they—they <laughs> they realize people are watching them. AT and T immediately. <laughs> immediately <laughs> the AT and T, the company, took out the full-page ad saying, "Yeah, we love net neutrality." Um, they immediately rolled out new features that are basically zero rating. They expanded their sponsored data program. If you're a prepaid wireless customer, you, guess who? Guess who you can watch with no cost to you in data? AT&T's own products, DirecTV, UVerse, and Full Screen. If you have an AT&T product, you no longer have to pay. It doesn't count against your data plan if you watch our stuff. I think that's exactly what we were talking about. Yep. Pa f paid fast lanes. Um, and it was AT&T who said, no, no, no. We, you know, we believe in net neutrality. Congress, so I, you're uh, going to get involved. I judge the Emma, Emmy Award judge. Uh -huh. And every year at about this time, I start getting all these DVDs in the mail. They're screeners, you know, for your consideration screeners. And just as this was happening, I got this giant box of AT&T shows. <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't even know existed. What? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. I'm not, the truth is I'm very, the, the AT&T Death Star doesn't worry me nearly as much as Comcast, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what'll happen. I think what, they are going to tread carefully initially. We'll see, but uh, Dropbox, uh, other big stories of the week, Dropbox uh, on Friday uh, went public with their uh, plans to file an IPO. Talk about another company that doesn't make any money. But they're but the good news is they're losing less money. Ooh. Instead of losing two hundred some million dollars as they did two years ago, they only lost one hundred ten million dollars last year. Can you imagine going back in a time machine two hundred years and telling everybody <laughs> that like if you're going to be a success if you're if you're like losing you're going to lose twenty million dollars two hundred million dollars a year <laughs> you're going to be a success brilliant, brilliant business plan you're going to own yeah. a yacht yep. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I don't buy stocks in the tech companies, so I don't listen to me. But I I don't even understand it. You know, I uh, do you buy stock in a company that has no that is not making money, and because well, someday they will, or or what? Uh, they Somebody wanna... named Kylie, who is a Bitmoji, is going to cause your <laughs> yeah it's yeah hard to imagine this yeah. now yeah Kylie, <laughs> just remember this future per, past person. It's coming. Dropbox is uh, valued, privately valued. Now at $10 billion, they plan to raise about half a billion dollars with the IPO. Wow. That's nice. a lot of money. Nice work if you can get it. Staggering amount of money. Yep. Especially with the higher competition. It's, you know, I find myself asking all the time, like, why do I continue paying Dropbox $20 a month when I have, you know, iCloud Drive and all these other, you know, services? It's, right. it's a well-done service, but I... You know, I find myself increasingly asked why I'm paying for it. It's hard to think of a differentiator, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, the user interface is phenomenal. I mean, if you if you've ever tried using Box or um, even Google yep. Drive, uh, is is uh, for a lot of businesses, I think it makes more sense to use Dropbox because it's just so intuitive. You have a you have a folder on your desktop that syncs to the cloud, and um, and it's just it's a lot easier to use. You can see. Uh, photo previews much more easily than you can in a lot of services. And so um, I don't know. Yeah, I always thought they were all sort of the same. It's like, oh, I can just kind of interchange any one of these cloud services. But what I've come to realize is that um, they're all vastly different from each other. And, oh, and, interesting. You know, right. a lot of my friends prefer Dropbox, honestly. Um, a lot of my friends that, are, that, own, that, that own and operate businesses. I had uh, all of them, and I still have many of them. I had iCloud. I had uh, Microsoft's. OneDrive, Google Drive, uh, some oddball ones like Treasure It. Uh, and I just recently killed them all except Dropbox because Dropbox, it's an ecosystem thing. All the iOS apps save to iCloud and Dropbox. And actually a lot yep. of them don't even save to iCloud. Yeah. And so yeah. it's just, it's there. Now I also am aware of, as we talked about earlier, that Dropbox is not private that the keys are held by Dropbox, so you shouldn't put anything there that you want to 
put up privately. So I just use it as a as because services on iOS expect it for their storing their um, settings and storing their files yeah. and things like that. So yeah. yeah, so maybe they do. Maybe they do have a a reason to be. I think we should wrap this up. We've been going long enough. You guys are <laughs> are champions. You haven't gone to the bathroom in hours. Dinner is cold. <laughs> And Amy Webb, you could tell your husband I got the computer glasses you recommended. He recommended, oh, yeah, yeah. That's great. He, after, I will absolutely. Know. After we How talked, are they working out? they're great. I, after we talked last time, I realized that's what I need to sit at my desktop because I can barely see it. And I and I took your advice and got the blue filter oh, yeah. in it and the slightly higher magnification, and it's great. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's so awesome. That's it worked. great. So thank him nice. for me. Her, yes, I will do. Her that. husband is a ophthalmologist, but. Uh, he also is good for advice about that kind of thing. And Amy is a futurist. Her book, The Signals Are Talking, is is really great. She gives away all the secrets of her trade, in, in which is bizarre. But, hey, if she's going to do it, you might as well read it. <laughs> Why Today's Fringe is Tomorrow's Mainstream. And we will be looking for the Future Today Institute trend report, which you can get from the website. Or go to amyweb.io and find out more about everything Amy's up to. So nice. To, oh, as always, great to have you on. Thank yeah. you, Amy. Uh, Brianna Wu, we're rooting for you. Brianna Thank Wu you. in 22. No, that's wrong. We need a slogan. <laughs> uh, who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? call? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love You need a meme generator on your website. You could have people make I posters. I thought about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, you know, this is, this is 2018. Positive attention is almost as valuable as negative attention. That's a good so, point. You know, That's a very good point. Uh, we don't, don't forget Bush Cheney. They, they, didn't they win in 2004? They I believe they, they did. did. They did. Who, who are you going to call? Brianna Wu. Who That's who. Call? I like it. I do want to say, if you want to donate to my campaign, it's support Brianna dot com so support Bree B R I B R I A N N A dot com support Brianna dot com and find mm -hmm. out more about her candidacy Brianna Wu 2018 dot com and if you're in the Massachusetts 8th September mark it in the calendar the, f <laughs> the first Tuesday in September you have a job to do who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? <laughs> Send me a tweet. How many congressional candidates will be like, yeah, I'll come have coffee with you? Nice. <laughs> like, I'll, That's you nice. You know, That's we can great. do that. Uh, so, so happy to know you, Brianna, and so proud of what you're doing. It's fantastic. Likewise. A lot of people yep. would just, you know, disappear, move to an island. <laughs> yeah. You said, I'm going to take the bull by the horns. Let's do it. Yep. I'm a fighter. Michael Nunez. From Mashable, where he's senior tech editor there. His day has been long. Deputy tech editor. I just promoted you. Sorry. Uh, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> get that senior guy out of there. The uh, <laughs> this day has been long. You started early with uh, Mobile World Congress. I thank you for staying late with us. Uh, at oh, thanks Michael for F. This Nunez. has been awesome. Always um, a pleasure. Thank yeah, you, the Michael. panel was so fun. Aren't today. they great? great? Yeah, it's really awesome. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this, like more than I should have as a participant. I know, so, I know what fun. you mean. That's why I do this show. I just, to me, it's all about just, I get friends in and I sit back and go, aren't you guys smart? Wow. Yeah. You make me think. I learn. I love it. And I include you in that, Michael. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for watching. If you want to watch live, we do it 3 p.m. Sunday afternoons, Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC. We have a live stream at twit.tv slash live. You can listen to a live audio stream too on any uh, voice activated device. I was just playing with the Echo the other day and you actually now have to say, Echo, listen to Tune In Twit Live. But if you say that, your Echo will play our live stream so you can see whatever's going on in the studio at any given time. Or you can ask for any individual podcast and hear the most recent version. Echo, listen to This Week in Tech. You'll get the most recent version. You can also uh, go to our website, twit.tv slash live. If you do any either of the live things, please join the chat room because that's a great way to give us feedback i'm watching the chat room as we go i get great ideas links all sorts of information uh, it's really important part of our uh, our broadcast day for the live shows please irc.twit.tv uh if you want to be in the studio live we had a great live audience today it's fantastic email us tickets at twit.tv and we will make sure there's a chair out for you um if you can't watch live we always have on-demand versions of everything we do both audio and video 
at our website and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. In fact, if you do me a favor and subscribe, that would be great. Don't forget, uh, I think there's a little time left to take the survey, twit.tv slash survey. Once a year, we try to learn a little bit more about you, not because we're going to share that with any third party, but just because it helps us do a better job. And when advertisers ask us things like, you know, are you, are you people college educated? We have it. We could say, yeah, 5% <laughs> of them are. Or whatever. I don't know what the number is. I'm sure it's higher than that. Thank you. I hope, I hope so. Thank you. I'm not, so I don't know. Uh, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Another twit is in the can. Bye-bye, everybody.